oh, he's a bread oh, scientist. The, church, the best one I've got, to, I've have to have found is the Church Militant. They are the best one. I, I totally forgot about them. Um, in fact, some of you may have heard already that uh, that Milo Yiannopoulos is no longer gay. I don't know if you've heard this I news. Saw that I saw today. that today. Yeah. Oh my god! And guess what? I had the inside scoop on that because I have been covering for some time. In fact, I can show you. Give me just one second. I'll show you something really cool. Hold on one one second real quick. Let me just... Um... Vosh is in the middle of a monologue. I don't know what... <laughs> what doing. So you might see this fish hat that I'm wearing at the moment. Um, and I'll explain in a second. But this fish hat really needs to be seen to be believed. And it'll make sense in just a second. So I'll remove the fish hat now. And I'll explain. So a couple of months ago, I discovered a extremist uh, Christian Spoon. channel known as Faith Militant or Church Militant, sorry. And uh, through them on their website, they have a bunch of shows that they run, one of which is like a, a skit comedy show called Holy Mackerel. And that is actually the same mask that they use for that skit show. Um, not the literal same one, but the same one. And we bought it because we had so much fun with Holy Mackerel. The the the, the pitch of the show is uh, um, if you eat meat on Friday, the Holy Mackerel will appear and originally slap the food out of your hand. But later he moves on to more drastic things like shooting people with lasers or uh, sent, dispatching a security team. It's ridiculous. It's very ridiculous and funny. Um, and we discovered this through the church militant, but the church militant okay. is, and this is how it all ties. It's all going to tie back around. I promise the church militant, the leader of that cult is a guy named Michael Voris. Michael Voris is the one who convinced Milo Yiannopoulos to renounce his gaydom and, um, and, uh, is himself an ex gay. Um, so now you've, now the whole circle has been made with the fish mask, but yeah, I've been covering Michael Voris for a while. So when I found out that it was him who, uh, talked to My Milo Yiannopoulos some time ago and, and planted the seed for Milo's ultimate, um, anti-gayening um i was pretty fascinated and i was very happy to uh well we're going to talk about that tonight in full so it'll be very interesting that's the long long no, answer for the the funniest right-wing channel welcome wow whoa yeah, sorry, we're we're only waiting because Socked on the Left has uh, has to wait a minute. So oh, what a piece if of shit! Hey, do your thing you you leave minute, my femboy alone. I'll I'll, I'll, guess, I'll I'll fix him one second. For right now, while I, I got know. you guys here, so over on the right, there's a private chat. If you guys need to say anything that you want to say off camera, you can click on the private chat and put it over there. Uh, if you want to put your links in there, you can go ahead and do that, and I can put them in my chat as you guys are doing intros and outros. Um, once in a while, we might pull up comments on the bottom. Oh, that's covering him up. Uh, we might pull up links on the bottom, but you have uh, hey, no obligation to read them or anything. Um, God, I hate reading. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Welcome. Hey, buddy. And then, um, yeah, for the most part, we do the panels for like uh, – more so conversations than it is like to debate or anything like that, though we do still debate, just we want to um, be able to bounce ideas off of each other. So we get a lot of people that have like similar ideas and ideologies to each other. But again, we still debate and disagree if it comes up, just for the most part, we uh, pontificate and talk uh, about things. Um, We've had a couple of times where the panels have kind of gone downhill because everybody came in expecting blood sports, though we told them numerous times it wasn't blood sports. That's mm -hmm. what they expected anyways. And uh, we, uh, we <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Samantha. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, uh, outside of that, anybody have any questions? So private chat is private. That's why it's called private chat, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That does make sense. <laughs> but I can have the comment section open on screen. Yes. And, okay, good. I'm lazy and I just want to throw it up there. Okay. Um let's see. I think that's it. If everybody's ready to go, we can go ahead and get started. I've got my stream muted right now, but 
if anybody wants to go to the bathroom or grab vape juice or batteries or anything real quick. Turn my stream on. I hear you. <laughs> I don't want to use people. That was me. I got everybody's streams up. All right. Mm. Can okay. I start streaming? Is that is that allowed? I wasn't. I didn't want to like start with. Yeah, that. we. But why we're like in private chat? Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and stream. Oops. I, okay. I'm streaming. What are you talking about? I was just asking. I'm trying to be You're like the cutest person ever. Like, is that allowed? Like, like, like can I do I'm, that, please? I'm just trying to be nice. <laughs> like, why? Okay. <laughs> I'm just... All right. I will <laughs> unmute my stream then, and we'll go ahead and get started. Let's do it. All right. Let me turn the music off too. All right. Appreciate everybody joining us. This is a Twitch politics panel every night at 9 15 Eastern Time here on Tom Foolery. Uh, we stream live on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitch. Nah, people, uh, today I'm, we have. I want people to know it's my stream. Awesome co host, K Fellows. But thank you. Uh, Samantha Banana, Demon Mama, Joe Lewis, Hans of Harkir, mm. Vosh, and Sock Done Left. We are, this is our leftist panel today. Um, we've had a bunch of other panels. We had an all right wing panel last week. We had a all lib panel with uh, like Destiny and Denims and uh, Dylan and all of them. And now this is our leftist panel that we're doing today. So we'll start off by going around and letting everybody introduce themselves. Um, don't hey, freak the out host, when it zooms dog. in on you because that's supposed to happen. Everybody didn't leave. Um, but yeah, we will start with K Fellows. Yeah, I've done this like 5 million times and every time it zooms in on me, I like still get like super awkward. But hey guys, I'm K Fellows. <laughs> um, I am a politics and pro-life activist. Uh, I occasionally upload to a YouTube channel. I'm not enough to call myself a YouTuber, uh, but I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm going to have a good conversation. Awesome. Appreciate it. And then we'll go to Samantha Banana. Uh, I'm Samantha Banana. I stream some time. I'm just out here uh, doing politics and uh, most likely making fun of people being slightly problematic um, and everybody's favorite non-tanky uh, communist. Awesome. Uh, Hans of Hark here. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Hans. Uh, Hans of Hark here. Uh, you can all call me Hans. Uh, I am a market socialist. Uh, I stream news and politics stuff, and I play Pokemon uh, when I'm not dying from 70-hour work Pickle. weeks. Uh, it's really good to be on the panel. I'm really excited to talk to everybody. So Awesome. Joe Lewis. Yeah, what's going on? Um, so I stream on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash Joe Lewis, the O being a zero. I'm glad to be here. Glad to see some some convergence of faces that I've seen on Twitter a lot. So it should be fun conversations. Glad to be here. Awesome. Appreciate you joining us, Demon Amazing. Mama. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Demon Mama. You can find me at demonmama.com. Uh, I uh, am a YouTube political edutainer. I do a lot of streams. We talk about a lot of news. We talk a lot of uh, current issues and we do a lot of debates we just got done having a pretty intense debate about bitcoin um and after every panel i always do a q a so if you want to argue with me or you have questions for me come on by after the panel and we can talk um i'm really happy to be here so thank you for having me uh vosh uh hey there my name is vosh i'm a professional blood uh, bloodborne live streamer um uh broken many thank world you. records Double and every H. once in a while i dabble best. in politics and that's why i'm here Happy awesome. to see you again, Thank you. And then Sock Dunn left. Hey, I'm Aiden. I do debates and uh, memes. You can find me on YouTube, Socialism Dunn left. I really like that collar. My man looking mm -hmm. fine tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hans moved to the left of Market Socialist to hear. Hey, that, that was all you, man. You read to build me like four months ago. It was nice. Nice. Okay, so uh, we got our first two topics. Um, anybody in the chat who wants to uh, suggest, we always do a I am on third this topic yes. suggested by the chat at the end. If you want to suggest one, just put the words topic at the front, and my mods will copy them and send them I'm to deranged. me, and then we'll do a straw me? poll towards the end. Um, the first topic tonight is going to be about Twitch politics or yes, online politics in general. Uh, for leftists, not I guess I, I differentiate the left and leftists. I don't know if everybody else uh, does that, but um, kind of 
for people who are uh, economically socialist and farther left from there. Um, what do you think about the online discourse when it comes to leftists and uh, the toxicity? What do you think about infighting when it comes to leftists? Um, are there problems there? Do you think it doesn't reflect on the left at all when somebody says something stupid? Or do you think it re reflects poorly on you? Um, Hans, since this was uh, somewhat of your topic, I will let you start us off and then anybody can jump in from there. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks. So. I guess why I started this question is because there's been a lot of the panels that we've uh, had, or a lot of like panels that have happened on Twitch, uh, either they seem to be uh, people fighting over nitpicking or like extremely, uh, say, fringe issues. Um, there's not a lot of, say, potential synthesis between like different uh, ideals of like uh, socialism, whether like you're an anarchist, whether you're like, you know, an ML, whether you're a market socialist. Um, I wanted to know like for, from each of you, like what do you feel the general discourse is going towards? Do you think it's positive? Do you think it's negative? Uh, what do you feel like your you know places in like change, potentially changing or like altering the discourse? Where do you want the discourse to go? I'm saying discourse a lot. It's becoming less of a word. Uh, that was just where I uh, wanted to start because we're participating in the discourse. So I figured it'd be a good way to start uh, with a meta analysis. So go ahead and give your position on it. Um, I personally got into this uh, partially because I was uh, I was really uh, inspired uh, by Vosh. Hi, also uh, fan fanboying. Um, you were like my favorite YouTuber in 2020. You're super cool, um, and I wanted to help uh, correct misinformation. I wanted to help uh, be a voice that could potentially uh, be as left wing as possible while still uh, you know, giving uh, heavy heavy levels of charitability, especially to libs. I want to like bring libs to the left. Um, I want to uh, talk, talk to people like Tom, who are what I would consider like a, like solid like uh, cons conservative suckdems, and I think uh, Hello, moving everyone. that discourse uh, in American society generally to the left of where it is right now is my overarching goal uh, beyond just making the world a uh, better place. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm small right now. I'm ha I, I, I do debates with all sorts of stuff. I argue about foreign policy and economics. I have a bachelor's in public policy. That's kind of what I wanted to do after I left college. And I was inspired by some, some people like specifically on this panel. So I, that's where I feel like I am. And as I grow, I want to keep making uh, the, this change like towards a more positive uh, fact-based discourse and also a more left-leaning discourse. Uh-oh, Tom is uh, muted. Hey, pro streamer, you're Sorry. muted. Yeah, anybody can jump in from there. You can go ahead, Samantha. Oh God. Um, well, so the leftist spaces and Thank how you, everything is going with discourse is kind of relatively new to me. I'm a, you know, like an ex-libertarian socialist, uh, heavy on the libertarian, not so heavy on the socialist, um, and uh, you know all ex-military background. Uh, grew up Christian, survivor of um, the, the Pray the Gay Away camps back in the late 90s, um, quite a bit older than most of you here, um, and came from a different mindset. Recently, not sure. I have Don't gone, have not that recently, say like last August, I went from um, like hyper libertarian, fuck you, come take my guns, you know, wrap myself in the flag to like, Hello, Jack. Let's talk okay, later. so would it be Stick really around. that bad if we like burnt down the White House and started from scratch? Um type of mindset uh i started with uh, some friends got me das capital um communist manifesto um and then you know people reeled me in from going to the extremists and uh just quick shout out to the most reasonable leftist that i've met um and a person who's wonderful for discourse uh proudly radical kai turned me onto this book rules for radicals um which <laughs> um in the discourse would come up quite a lot which um where i go with that is like i've seen a lot of people that talk to me um, in leftist spaces where it was when I was libertarian, like very, very vile. Like they didn't want to let me have my speak. My opinion wasn't valid because I didn't believe the same thing. They just wanted to shut down discourse before it started. Um, there was no change in my mind. There were no, hey, look at these. It was just, you're wrong. Hold on, shut the fuck up. Here's why. And then there's been a lot of reasonable people who were willing to tolerate me being kind of stupid in the, in their mind. And have deeper conversations with me, like, hey, maybe like let's not debate about this on on Twitch. Why don't you hop in a, on, on a Discord with me? Let's talk. Um, and this has happened over and over again. And a lot of people, and, and to this day, a lot of people will come reach out to me and and kind of teach me new things or better ways to do things and better ways to have discourse. Um, so sorry for rambling, but it, it, it this is all still fresh in my mind with the discourse because of a lot of the great people that I've met recently who are able to have. 
um, discourse without shutting me out because I believe differently. Yeah, Vash. Oh, I think the discourse is in a great part, uh, place right now. Yeah, there's no issues, no complaints, really. I think one of the big issues is that we kind of started off on a back foot. For about four or five years, conservatives were the only ones really throwing their weight around when it came to online political discourse, blood sports, whatever you want to call it, debates. And um, unfortunately, they've reached a point now where a lot of the people who were able to propel themselves to stardom off of the premise that lefties are afraid of debate are now large enough that they no longer benefit from debating people. It means that there aren't that many pickings amongst existing leftists who are trying to involve themselves in the discourse, which means that they are committed to arguing with one another instead, usually over asinine, meaningless, nitpicky disagreements. So you have that. Um, also, I think there's this insipid tendency amongst a lot of leftists online to prioritize identity over um, actual political difference, like to distinguish themselves in some way, to make them distinct from, say, Democrats, for whom they were probably often mistaken back when they were 14 and edgy. And it's uh, their, their prerogative to make sure everyone around them knows that they're you know, not a Democrat, they're different, they're different. But often what that does is it leads them to adopting a lot of incredibly stupid fucking positions for no reason other than because it distinguishes them. It's an identifier. Um, so we need to get rid of that too. Uh, I don't think that being a leftist means that you have to adopt absurd, economically illiterate positions as a, as a, as a component of distinguishing yourself from less good social progressives, you know? Demon Mama, you guys can jump in. Uh, yeah, um, my thoughts on the online left. Uh, for a long time, I have uh, uh, sort of advocated the position that uh, I don't really care all that much about um, most of what people call infighting. Um, I think that that is usually um, sort of a uh, evidence that, that we have many different ideas that are, we're willing to clash over them and talk about them and grow and hopefully grow from them. Uh, lately, I will say that there has been an increasing um, trend of like, I would say like inter left attempts at de like deplatforming and 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 mass brigading. And I find that to be like really distasteful. Um, there's been like a number of really big examples that I won't really jump into right now unless the conversation goes there. But that's something I find to be really destructive um, and bad. Uh, our disagreements, our ability to think differently is one of our strengths. And I really like the fact that, like, lefties are willing to challenge one another um, when they aren't, like, for some reason committed to destroying one another um, and one another's ability to do stuff. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, in general, I think that um, a, a lot of how good discourse is depends on which platform you're talking about. On YouTube and on Twitch, there's lots of good discussions happening. On Twitter, it's kind of a horrible hell site. And I have my whole reasons for that. But, um, yeah, I think there's uh, some good things going on. And there's a lot of questions and a lot of uh, challenges in front of us that I'm excited to see um, the incredibly talented and driven people who do make up the online left discuss and challenge. Because I think that's personally very exciting. So, yeah. Sack done left. Um, I was going to agree a bit with what Vosh said. Um, there was recently a TikTok from a person named Honda Yang that I quite agreed with that. A lot of people who became socialists um, came from being liberals. And it seems to be, that Honda suggests anyway, that uh, many liberals feel that their politics is something that gives them like a moral righteousness, that they are a liberal because it's the correct thing to do, and therefore they are a better person. And so they extend this when they become a leftist by being the best person possible, by being the most left in the room. And so it becomes this sort of identity game where you've got to be the most pure, the most radical, the most extreme, as opposed to actually like say the most based in evidence, the most like specific on a given policy or an otherwise constructive to the discourse. And so I think that there is a lot of identity game playing which is ultimately about self vindication and then truth as Vosh suggested vindication yeah. within communities um, kind of getting people to identify with you and then getting out group to hate on um, so I think that's actually one of the biggest issues but that will probably also never go away so I don't know that's a solvable issue either what about you Joe yeah I kind of approach this in a little bit of a different way only because I'm very much involved outside of the internet <laughs> um, 
So for um, so I might take this like kind of in a different direction for myself, right? So for me, online involvement should lead to local action and involvement. So if I were to build a sort of political, politically activated community online, I would want that community to be collaborating not only at what we call like a national level, which would be like talking to me, people like within like a like a chat or something like that, but have local chapters and local just like involvement internally. So for example, if I were to create like a Joe Lewis party, right? It would be that like, okay, there, there's me, Joe Lewis, but then there's also like little chapters like Joe Lewis party West Coast, Joe Lewis party Northeast, and then collaborating not only at the local level, but then branching out to other chapters for assistance and stuff like that. So like a more driven sense of community. Um, I think something that gets lost in the online discourse is the fact that we come from communities and our experience is gonna be pretty much predicated, I think, on our relationships with our own communities. And something that I think everybody can maybe relate to at some level especially how I started getting politically involved, it can get really lonely where you think that like, my, my the only person with these ideas out there in the wild. And then the internet shows you like, there are people who like have the same, maybe similar relationships with these structures of power and all these type of things. But what I'm trying to, to do is, is to show people that, hey, there are people in your local communities that, that wanna like, they're just looking for that person that they wanna dance with. And, Something that I think that we can try to do as people on the left is is remind people that, hey, we're all part of our own communities. And I think the more involved we are with our own communities, understanding our local problems and then branching out to a national thing, right? Like that that's where kind of like where my goals line up. And and yeah, like Twitter Twitter is a gulag, but at the same time, like if it wasn't for Twitter, I wouldn't find many people within my own community that, that you thought did, similar to I was and looking for ways to help. So it's kind of like a double edged sword. I guess the balancing act is like how do we I guess the question that I have my guiding thought is We do have our own trolls, yes. How do we get people to that sounds so like matrixy where it's like how do we get people to understand that that they are just one voice in their community and that voice has value and then getting more people aligned with you and to push towards like getting more political power in any way possible so that's kind of where i'm at on it so do you see any problem with like uh purity testing within the left or like trying to say you're not a real leftist if you don't believe this or you're not you're not even on the left or uh or, or you're not one of us or something like that I, I get. I don't know if that's to me, but but um, I I I stopped giving a shit years ago. Um, I'm in a township that has nonpartisan elections, so we're not even allowed to expose our political ideology when we run. Um, the same thing happened in my other township before they changed that. So when I started getting politically involved, I didn't really have this idea of sort of like purity testing people. So when I navigated online, I noticed that like people kept trying to sort of like self categorize me, right? Like I've heard things is from from all sides of it, where it's like I'm a mask off, I'm a mask like mask on tanky to to a mask off black extremist to to just a to crypto black national. I've heard like all types of shit from that perspective. But in reality, it's like I think that people want to put hats on people just for to get a a general idea of where they stand, where I think something that we could try to do is just ask more questions about people's ideology and where they stand on things. I think that might be a better way of approaching those type of conversations. So then like uh, Joe, uh, given that, do you feel like the best way is try to like individually activate people to encourage them to be active in the communities? Uh, this is like specifically like related to something that's happened like recently, like with, like with the Destiny Omaha stuff, right? Like not getting like too much into that. But do you feel like there are potential barriers to say like uh, having a large online creator or just online creators in general trying me. to organize things beyond to say like, uh, sto them. like almost like stochastically encouraging people to be active not inside sure. their communities? Like, what do you feel like is the so. best way forward in that regard? Do you feel like we should try and do both? Like, uh, do you feel like it's important to try and like focus on one or the other? What do you feel like would be most useful uh, given like everything that's happened recently? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I think knowing, and, and maybe um, definitely for Socked on Left, right? Or I think something that, that Socked on Left, Vosh, Demon Mama, Samantha, yourself, so everybody here, right? Is that we have to kind of like identify where our strengths are and like, hey, what are we strong at that we can contribute for within our communities, right? And and something that that could happen where if if 
if like SDL is just like, you know what, I'm really good at making YouTube videos and just pushing that social wisdom wagon baby, then like maybe that's the that's the thing that you do. Thank like, you, double there, triple H. There's like a yeah. lane for every type of political involvement that could transfer over into community involvement but it's just kind of finding where that is and that takes a while right where it's because when you're first like before i'm just anecdote and andre over here where it's like when i first started getting involved i had no idea what my strengths were and it, and it took just like sort of trial and error of like okay well i really like this so let me try doing this for a little bit okay i really suck at that even though i really like it but let me try something else and then like what i sort of fell into with my community is just getting the people to where they need to be so i my strength comes from galvanizing people that might be the best word but getting people just like there um because one thing that thankfully through my stuff in college and stuff like that i'm really good at harassing people to go to events and, and getting people involved right so it's that like what happens sometimes is the first reach out happens where it's like hey i'd love for you to come to this this thing that we're having um and maybe it's like oh i really like this movie i'll go to this movie night and it's like sure but maybe there's like another message for that movie night like getting people to make sure that they're registered and stuff like that whatever i think the the next step from there is like the follow-up of like hey i saw you were there I'm, I'm really thankful for you being there i'm wondering like how you felt about the event like what are some things that we could have done better and then like slowly getting them knowing that their voice matters within your community and then just seeing where they're at like not everybody's going to want to be involved in the same level of like activism from one person to another um but i do think that the f one step is just sort of looking within to figure out okay like where can i fit in my own community and then where can i fit in in the community at large and then the community at large is being online so i know many people who are one way online and then like, like myself for example i'm a perennial twitter shitter but then like offline when people have conversations like oh this is a totally different person now the, the problem comes when those two worlds converge right where if you have a really active online presence and then your offline presence might be be different i think and again like maybe people might differ on this i feel like as close as you can get those things to to who you are i think is better but in reality those are just two sides of us right like we're all different people with different types of relationships with things um so maybe like those two sides are just part of who you are but i think that maybe getting them closer to like a center might be a way to to help i, I don't know I'm, I'm rambling i'm sorry about that no i think with what you were saying joe with people's different strengths is kind of where another form of like um I'm going to, I don't know if this is a correct term for it. Like I said, new lefty kind of, um, the, the purity testing. So it's like people that want to be just active in their local community. Um, say like just doing stuff like, Based mods. um, the paperwork, uh, you, getting mods. elections going, getting, getting local stuff, you know, just being the person in the suit running around doing the, the bitch work with the paperwork. Right. You know, and then you're going to have people like, oh, well, you're not out of the protest. You're not out here raising your voice. It's like, okay, you have different people that can do different things and different strengths. Like not everybody can like a lot of people that can't go to protest, like, you know, they don't want to like um, maybe take their kids or, or maybe they, they have a job that they can't give up, especially like at a time, like during COVID or something, there's a lot of things you have to consider, but maybe they are doing stuff elsewhere in the political sphere that is making a difference. Um, like you were saying with YouTube personalities, if you have charisma and you can talk in a way that people will listen, be it a, a, a left leaning person or a right leaning person, you are way more valuable that then people are going to give you credit for um because if you can get both sides to listen to you and get them moving left towards what you hold as values a lot of people look at content creators and kind of start taking their beliefs more and more and more a little bit over time um for the most part there are exceptions to that rule um you know you hold much more value because you're going to get that platform you're going to be able to teach way more people and reach out to way more people because of that charisma and maybe you'll grow like a massive following um, then you have the people that their strength, they know the politics within the politics world. So they're able to get into like city hall type um, positions or events. They're able to get in, like start reaching out at a local level, branching into the actual political world rather than just bitching about it on the internet. And then there's a you know place and time where people do need to just bitch about it on the internet to like kind of get like a movement going. And then you have people that are really good at just, you know, hey, marching, making signs, getting stuff organized, organizing people to move. Um, you know, organizing with that friend that works in city hall doing the bitch work. And now you have a, a license to go do a protest or, or like a permit. Um, and then you have the people in um, uh, say 
other parts of organizing that are really good at stirring shit up or using counter military tactics against the police to keep people safe. Like you have strengths and everybody should kind of like go rather than attack someone for not doing more, be like, you know, just recognize what they are doing and that 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 is enough to help the movement. Yeah, uh, to jump off that, I, I do think that there is a, a, a I don't, I don't want to say it's like a like overstated, like it's a huge problem, but I think that some people should should think a bit harder about just how many people we really need to make a shift left on the, you know, sort of national and local scale. We need a lot of people and um, we need a lot of different types of people. If you look at, at how um, I always like to, to point out like conservative radio, which is something that when I was younger, like I grew up listening to conservative radio with my conservative parents. They had that on all the time. And there are just all manner of conservative talk shows that have been bankrolled, that have been encouraged, that are, are patronized by all these people. And there are varying quality. There's, you know, the really famous people, like you get the Rush Limbaugh, um, you know, but then there's also like the local people of like middling repute. Um, and, and this is something that's really important because it allows for, uh, it allows for in this case with the Republicans, uh, a control of the narrative. And I think it's really important that, that the left gets to a point where we can at least check that narrative, if not completely demolish it, um, with, uh, you know, the, uh, oft mentioned facts and logic. Um, but, you know, I, I think that we're sort of in a position where right now we need experimentation. We need a lot of people willing to make stuff. And it's hard to do, but I don't think it's impossible. And and I really think that we should um, encourage um, many different approaches and many different styles. Um, and I, that doesn't mean that you never criticize anybody, but I think that there should be uh, perhaps a, a, a limit to our criticisms where we say maybe we have different styles, maybe we have different approaches, but that's actually good for us. Having that diversity of approach can be super, super good for us. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of agree that there's like this need for like online uh, a, a broader analysis of the like of the strategy with regard to media. I think there's room for lefty cooking channels. I think there's room for barely political shows that just happen to be run by a lefty and and once in a while touch on those lefty values. I mean, these exist for conservatives all over the place. There are a million uh, you know, I mean everything from the more like to outsiders, I would say, would be more obvious, like church shows. There's local Christian radio stations that don't purport to be super conservative, but do talk about that all the time. To, uh, again, like I said, the extreme examples like Rush Limbaugh, which are obviously partisan and very aggressive. But I think that we need, like, all of that stuff. We need to be able to check that and counter that. And it is hard because we don't have the Coke money and whatever. But I think we have some other strengths. We certainly have... Um, a better, um, we have better memes. We have better analysis of, of culture. Um, and I think that we also have a lot more creativity and diversity among the ranks of the left, um, which I think can overcome some of the disadvantages that the American left has specifically. I mean, you say we, we don't have the Coke money, but, um, isn't it like more likely that people on the left are going to be like college educated um, than it is for people on the right? Like, I feel like the right just tends to do more with less. Um, I, I'm not... No, no way. Um, like college education means basically nothing in the face of the accumu of the accumulated capital. Like we live in objectively in one of the most um, w like wealth unequal times of history um and being able to mobilize that amount of of uh material power is really hard to understate no amount of like college educated and mostly unemployed because of the state of the economy um uh people are going to be able to counter that monetarily there just isn't that type of money i mean even again uh, like i've got rush limbaugh on the mind because you know uh yeah uh you know he kicked the bucket recently um but uh the praise the sun yeah yeah precisely but um 
but Rush Limbaugh um, was somebody who wielded money and wielded his influence in the industry to uh, spin up talented right wing presenters out of thin air um functionally they you know he would find somebody who was promising a demagogue that could be easily um propped up and would invest in it and he would have his inv advertisers all jump on board i mean it's wild if you actually look into the history of how he ran these things it was just like that you have all of the the cores the the, the far right investors that like like i said the cores family the cokes all of these different investing companies that with a right wing bent they would take the word from somebody like um they would take a word from somebody like uh, rush limbaugh and he'd go that guy and they would get a whole bunch of advertising deals and all of a sudden they can pay a producer they can run the, the, the a clean show okay. uh and self-enrich and and all it's of that a while yeah i can't type oh but it's we're getting some bleated uh bleeding mic it's okay i i muted her yeah um yeah so it's uh it's one of those things where i don't think that any amount of like college education like college educated people make more money than the average person but mm -hmm. you have to remember that the sh the the people who are actually running like a lot of the who actually have the, the 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 deciding say in a lot of these like big media companies are people with more money than than anybody you can imagine and you can't really overcome that especially when they're uh able to uh run at a loss when you're able if it's necessary if they even have to obviously the rushes will make lots of money but other other shows can run at a loss because they have a, a they have an angel investors who will keep pumping out that show for the ideological benefit not necessarily just for the profit i would also say like in terms of uh societal uh movements there is a lot of money towards say like social progressivism which is super fucking poggers but like the idea that um like specifically that college educated people like are inherently socialist a lot of them are just libs right and that's again like that's better than them being conservative but like to saying someone has a college education obviously like they're more likely to be like potentially a socialist but like they're much 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 more likely just to be like some flavor of like left-leaning lib and that's totally fine but i don't think that's like the same way and if we can't say counter the money uh demon mama right because like we're, we just don't have like enough like super like secret socialist like billionaires that can do this for us if our what what are our strengths it seems like our strengths then would, would be like you know, our online content creators who are, are like sort of like locus points for this stuff and then also people power right because so supposedly if we have like a bunch of like online engaged audiences especially for like you know the larger creators it seems possible that like getting those people to who wouldn't normally do this like sort of like boots on the ground stuff and i mean boots on the ground in terms of like activism i don't mean like fighting everyone i know the violence is bad um and so where what do you think is like the best way to, to counter uh that you like playing to our strengths and like playing against their weaknesses because it seems like the right is good at astroturfing they're good at money and they're good at like you know making uh uneducated people and again like i'm, I'm putting in a very broad brush right now if you're uneducated and you're not right -leaning, or if right, i'm not personally attacking you it seems like they're better at like just f either fear-mongering or attacking uh or like going after like less educated people or well there are I some advantages in that um like I do think that a lot of the um, like right wing talking points and stuff sort of appeal to a a base fear or or insecurity or whatever. And those are always, you know, that sort of emotional messaging is easier to broadcast. But I mean, also, there is a severe problem. And I think that some of this is the failure of like what what, what was considered American, the American left, which was mostly, like you said, liberals. Um, you'll notice that like uh liberal news sources are are always pay paywalled and meanwhile you've got rush limbaugh blasting out for free to every radio station in the united states zero cost anybody can get their old beat up car doesn't matter if it's from the 60s it's gonna have a radio in it and you can tune into some very entertaining right-wing radio and uh like we do have the people power and i think we do have the um we have the truth on our side obviously i believe that very much so um and i think that's demonstrable i think we just need to get more creative as, as to how we um interconnect and how we uh mutually empower one another and the sort of networks that we build i am of the belief that streaming is the is is the new radio it is it, it there's so much so many parallels that i see but one of those is that we can do stuff like have free shows that are viewer supported and that's possible thanks to the internet and it's possible thanks to networking with other people who are trying to build similar shows 
And there's another advantage, which is unlike uh, the era of the radio, where there's only a set number of, of radio waves that you can get on that are like controlled by the FCC, and there's a whole bunch of contracts that's really messy, basically anybody can spin up a YouTube channel, uh, provided you you know, have a certain bar of like, you know, you need to have a mic and stuff like that, obviously, but that's a lot lower than needing to have a radio station that you can use to broadcast onto the radio. So we have that going for us as well, that if we um, make uh, like confident and aggressive moves in this space and we actually build lasting structures, we build, uh, I don't know what the exact solution is, but channel networks or partnerships or whatever that can, re that can become resilient that is going to be amazing, and it will, I believe it will actually counter some of the uh, the disadvantage that the left has in not having um, Koch brothers and Rupert Murdoch's and, and you know, whoever else. Yeah, well, I think you made a good point. I, I When I said the right does more with less, it's not just with money, but I also think, like, rhetorically, they do a lot. Uh, ben Shapiro is, like, a Harvard grad and he's like, I guess, trained to make really good arguments for really bad points. And he does this a lot and convinces a lot of people. Um, Vosh, like, I think you uh, do a lot with rhetoric as well. Like, do you think that there's, uh, do you think that the right, like, overall does better with rhetoric? And, and do you think there's, oh, like, oh, yeah, we're children good? compared to them. Yeah, 100%. Your average leftist has absolutely no idea how to, or no interest in appealing to the average person. There's there's nothing there. There's zero. And that's the reason why there was a large um, contingent of the online left who broke away from people like AOC and Bernie Sanders. There's this obsession with, um, with aesthetizing theory, with aesthetizing the USSR, with aesthetizing China. Um, and, and even beyond that, even if you go back, I'm not just talking about tankies, by the way. I mean, like, this is really, really common, this complete departure from anything even remotely resembling the interests of the average member of the working class. And then you get into these incredibly esoteric arguments. Right now, what we're dealing with, there was this big Twitter blow up the other day, I'm sure you all saw it, or at least some of you did. Some chick said she used to be a Nazi, but now she's not. Turns out that person's in my community. Great, good. Uh, anyway, a bunch of lefties lost their mind. She, her community. soul is impure. It's been tainted. Uh, she can never again be let on. That's you, And it Lena. reminds me of this old That's comic you. that, I mean, it's been circled around the, around the internet for a while, but it's like, um, uh, you know what the, the comic I'm talking about. It's like the there's this, like... Um, pretentious looking guy with an undercut and he's like it's not my job to educate you if you want to learn about feminism why don't you just go look it up um wow you're feeling awfully entitled to my time right now um yeah that's about what i expect from a white person but then on the other panel it's like some dipshit skinhead with like a nazi shirt and he's like wow you want to hear about muslim rape statistics yeah let me go get my book yeah oh what well, black iq oh yeah sit down let me tell you like they're way more willing to engage. They're actually happy and excited to convert people. A lot of lefties just want to have their own little social space. And I have a cat that's losing their mind right now. <laughs> I don't know where they are. But well, the, the point is, I really feel like we're getting clowned on a lot. Hold on. Let me find this. What are we, what are we, what are we doing? Okay. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, to, yeah to, to Vash's point, it, it's, it's so funny to me how many... Um, uh, I guess we can call people out a little bit, right? Like we can we can dance a little bit. Um, there, there's so many when I'm doing whether it be like food activism or it's just like just a morning like like breakfast initiative or or just even just giving out shit. Like basically, what happens is is this: you get people who come into this to the space that I navigate in, and then they're so excited to to talk about like all the books they read and and like i'm so like i i, I was just reading up on on huey newton's book the other day and i just look at them and it's like bro i don't give a fuck like i don't like there there's i i there's something of value to be of reading texts internalizing texts and being able to take those texts internalize them and put those out into the real world world but one of the things i think it's lost in it is that you have to do it in a way that's genuine to yourself. And I think sometimes what happens is, especially when you're kind of new to the party and studying and internalizing this information, is that you automatically default to just regurgitating how you consumed it in. 
And something that I think is incredibly important is like, okay, how do I explain these concepts, these things that I want people to get very like excited and passionate about in a way that's genuine to me. And I think sometimes what happens, cause I've seen this in real time where people just like, will invoke the words of just like whatever Marxist Leninist bullshit they read that day. And it's like, bro, I don't give a fuck about the footnotes that you did. Like, how would you describe these things? And definitely the, the right found a way to to translate these things in, in a way that makes sense to the people they're, that they're trying to not only politically activate, but socially activate. And something that I think all all people of the left should try to do to the best of their ability is is own the things that they're reading, own the things that that they're researching. And and that level of ownership comes from being able to speak about these things in a way that not only makes sense to you, but makes sense to the people that you're talking to. Right. Like I don't give a like because again, we had to understand that the rhetoric, like the rhetoric against our things is incredibly powerful. Like it doesn't matter how many books about race and the history of race I'll do. People will default to, to just some like white ass libs, like Robin D'Angelo and, or even just like Twitter people like Kendi. And it's like, there's more people who do these things, but the people who are might be against your ideas don't give a fuck. Those are the people they're defaulting to. But if you're able to to take those things that you've read and internalize and explain them in a way that's that's natural to you, then I think that's a way that we can definitely like help with this this feedback loop that happens sometimes. Sock done left. I I mean I don't know how much more I can add. I think that everyone else has covered this pretty well. Well, I, I mean I can pretty much like section out my audience i've said this on here before where like i stream on facebook youtube and twitch and my facebook uh audience is by far the farthest right like youtube's kind of in the middle twitch mm -hmm. i just got on twitch a couple months ago i had never heard somebody say it's not my job to explain things to you i don't uh, like is that not why we're online like is that not why we're all streaming in, in the politics section like is that out if we're on here what it what else is the point in doing this if it's not uh to to convince tom, people tom it's not my job to, it, tom it's not my job to explain this to you okay, okay? I, mean, I, I, I think i can try and address that a little bit like i think it's a friend group thing they want a friend group. That's what they do. They go online, they stream, they make videos, but it's not to change people's minds. It's to find like-minded people that they can form a cute little social club with. The inclusion of people whose minds have been changed would only be a detriment to their social club because it would introduce unorthodoxy. I mean, well, I, I think there's... Real quick, real quick, fam. Um, like, I'm wondering, so, because when it comes to, like, I love your streams, but, 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 but dog, but dog, but dog, terminology wise, I, I'm like, God damn it, I gotta fucking reread on shit. But I guess a question <laughs> I have for you is that, what are, what are some ways that you think that people can do in terms of sort of owning the, the things that they read, um, and translating it into a way that makes sense for them? Like, where do you think some, I mean, someone could possibly start? I mean, if you want honest answers, it's mostly about how you study things. Wait, um, hold like on. Even Mama should go. Thank than you. everyone else. I appreciate that. Um, I sure. will say, I have a couple of things I wanted to say on this. The first thing is that, like, I think there is a... I don't want to underplay that there are, like, the fact that there are some people who really say it's, like, not my job to to teach you or whatever. I think some of this comes from, like, people who... Uh, gain some level of of standing on websites like twitter or or instagram or whatever and there is like as somebody who gets like a constant um uh, uh focus on my identity being trans like it happens all the time people are always having things to say about it it can be very frustrating um especially if like debating and politics isn't your primary thing so i do have some level of sympathy to some people who are just like it's not my my job but um, there, there comes a point where, like, we have to acknowledge that, like, we live in very s strange political times, and some of us are going to have to choose to, like, answer those questions. And as somebody who I was raised in an extremist, fundamentalist Christian cult, and that's a huge part of my background is, you know— finding my way out of something like that that i had no choice in that i was indoctrinated in that it was my world view that was 
totally different than that of everyone outside of it. Like there were things that were taken literally by my church that would make other people laugh because it's like, what, you literally believe that there's angels and demons like wrestling with each other invisibly. And yes, they did literally believe that. And I think it's hard for a lot of people on the left to understand that level of indoctrination and um, recognize that there's a, it, it can be a long process for people to get away from that, to get out of that. And it can also be a very painful process. And usually that type of person had no choice in those, the, uh, the, like the world that they grew up in. Um, in fact, that's kind of the point. Um, I, I think that the left would gain a lot. And I've, I've been hammering on this a lot on my streams. People who watch my streams have probably heard me say this a million times, but one of my big projects is I want people on the online left to start to understand how indoctrination works, specifically religious indoctrination, because, um, it is very manipulative. It is very isolating and it is designed to give you the illusion that you have nowhere else you can ever go, that you are on the precipice of apocalypse. It is you and it is your faith. And that is a very scary place for pe for human beings to be. So I, I, while I understand there are like, there are legitimate reasons for why people say like, oh, like I, 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 it's not my job to educate you. I agree. There's a lot of people whose job it isn't like a random trans makeup, uh, youtuber should not be expected to like constantly have to answer for their own existence at all times but at the same time the people who are doing the advocacy the people who are stepping out and doing that political thing should be able to understand how the ideology they're fighting against works and indoctrination is a huge part of most far-right ideologies so what what i would ask uh, this is primarily for demon and bosh is that it's very, I totally agree that it's, it's super important to have like this safe space for people who don't, who just who do not like, should not have to like validate their existence every second, right? It seems like the, like there's like a friction or a problem in, in like online spaces where the uh, overlap between say like the potential activist left people who are like uh, trying to do this, like the push for like different uh, like changes versus people who just want to be able to feel safe. Again, like both those are equally valid. It's a circle because we all exist inside the same communities. And I'm not sure how, or even if it's possible for us to differentiate those circles in any side of the community. It's like, and say like a, like Bosch is the biggest person here where it's like, there's no activist Bosch circle. And then like, uh, people hanging out, uh, in a safe political space, Bosch circle. Right. So how do we like, say, uh, cr almost like create, like, how, how do we deal with that distinction in a way that, uh, you know, makes everybody, uh, either feel more at home or, uh, makes us much more like potentially effective. If that yeah, okay, sense. I'll yeah, I'll take the hard stance on this one. Okay, first of all, um, there's no such thing as an online leftist community. There are hundreds and thousands of closely interwoven communities that nonetheless have distinct terminology, distinct preferences, ideas, personalities, what have you, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think it's about divisions within a community. I think it's about recognizing which communities have greater thresholds, greater uh, tolerances for quote unquote inappropriate behavior okay now if you go into like uh let's say a discord being run by abigail thorne or something i i, I think she closed her discord a while ago for some reason but say you go there okay whatever people are going to be sensitive you expect that that's just the channel that's the kind of attitude it cultivates mine well actually my discord i think is fairly sensitive but my community generally a little more on the edgy side fine as long as people know that i don't think there's anything wrong with that but the hard stance that i have to take is this one okay we need to get rid of the cult of sensitivity it's unbelievably toxic and it actually does a lot of harm to the people who adhere to it um there are a lot of people who seem to have forgotten that there is a very big difference between harm and offense and this sounds like a conservative talking point but if you go online for five minutes, I think you'll find people who legitimately do conflate these ideas. A person who was very victimized by the conflation of these two ideas was contrapoints. There were a lot of people who claimed that contrapoints had hurt them, that harm was done. But usually what these were were obfuscations of the actual discussion. They were excuses to bully her for perceived slights this that if investigated really true. weren't much of anything at all. I think that we should focus a little bit more on perceiving what is or is not actually harmful and a little bit less on what is perceived to be harmful. We talk back about that, um, can former Nazis be part of the left discourse, right? You know, and um, are people who used to be Nazis probably host to some ideas 
that are problematic currently, like still, almost certainly. I mean, that kind of stuff takes a while to completely move away from. I don't doubt that at all. I don't deny that. But usually because there's this perception of harm, this, um, this, this assumption that harm can be done through this person, that is treated as the same as harm actually being done. And for that reason, people are socially incentivized in a lot of lefty circles to play up how sensitive they are to perceived harm because they conflate that with how sensitive they are to seeing actual harm, which is a good thing. You should be very sensitive to being able to perceive harm, but perceiving harm and perceived harm aren't the same thing. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think to sort of you know, for my my take on this sort of thing, I, I think that one problem, and I don't even think this is necessarily isolated to just the online left. This is a lot of spaces in general. Um, is that like, there's not a whole lot of like, uh, there's not a whole lot of thought put into how communities actually like unfold. And and one thing I love about Discord, and the reason why I spend so much time on my Discord and in other people's Discords, but I invest a lot of time in my Discord, is because Discord allows you to actually like give a lot of um, agency to the people in your server. People can come to your server, they can jump into the debate channels where debate is, where it's really intense. I mean, we even have a place that's called the Arena, where you can, as long as like we have some hard rules, like don't drop slurs and don't talk about violence because those are discord rules. But if you go in there, you can, it's gloves off. You can call each other names. You can scream at each other and whatever. Um, but other spaces are not necessarily like that. And I think that part of the problem um, that we've seen in what, what is largely understood to be the online left is that it has unfolded in places like Twitter and Tumblr places that have no such distinctions some a lot of people like and it and i don't even blame them necessarily um because it is a structural thing twitter doesn't make it clear really what it is that you're doing a lot of people go on twitter and it's very easy to just type out your thoughts to your followers but anything that you that you type into twitter can become could become a viral a, a viral tweet and nobody thinks about that fact. So people will use a Twitter like their journal and then find themselves suddenly with hunt, with tens of thousands of followers and their thoughts, whether filtered or not, or whatever the purpose is, they may not even know themselves what, what the reason that they're tweeting these things out could go to thousands upon thousands of people. I think, Wait, oh, oh, go ahead. Really quick, I just want to say also SDL got skipped over, so they should talk after you. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but that's basically it. The, the, um, the 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 spaces that people curate and build um, are very are very unclear on a lot of these platforms, and the reason why I encourage people to move to move their communities to platforms like Discord is because it allows you to actually delineate those spaces, to set reasonable expectations, and to put power back into the hands of of the actual users themselves. Whereas in Twitter, people don't really have a control over their experience. On Discord, on Twitch, on YouTube, you do have some control over your experience. And that alleviates a lot of this um, conflation, I think, that Vosh was mentioning, which I do think exists, um, that some people... Mm -hmm find themselves exposed to or or on the uh, on the flip side expose others to their venting or their emotional feelings and it becomes very messy very quickly anyway yeah uh joe do you want to reiterate your question hey, in please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i can reiterate my question to stl Thanks. so because you i think you may you might remember it because you mentioned the idea of how people just just study improperly mm -hmm. right um Guess, do you remember the question exactly? Or... Uh, so I think part of it was like, how do we internalize books in a way that people aren't just regurgitating things, but are meaningfully adding like their own thoughts to it, right? Yes, yes. Hi, Lonnie. Uh, I mean, the answer I was going to give is a very boring, simple one. It's about how you study. Um, it's it, it's when you read books, take study notes. When you read studies, take study notes, make a fact sheet. I know this is all very boring stuff and it makes it a lot more difficult, um, but I think that there's a there's a genuine utility of Basically, when, when you what I do is I like take a study and I make a summary of it. It's like a one sentence, two sentence thing. And that literally forces you to put into your own words and demonstrate that you've understood the study. Um, so that's more difficult for books because they're enormous. But um, that's why what I do, I, I take quotes out of it and then I do the same thing for the quotes. Um, 
So yeah, I know those then, very boring answers, but oh no, yeah. I mean, obviously, like that's that's the uh, that's the teacher answer I have too, right? But then also too, like even something as simple as just like talking to people about it, right? Where like you'll you'll find sometimes where um, just even talking about a book you read can sometimes be really hard, like, because like even like because right now I'm going through some of Thomas Sowell. And there, and there are points where, like, I, I, I would just be, like, deep in just, like, reading and reading and reading. And then I would, like, catch myself, like, 3 a.m. It's like, I didn't internalize any of this. <laughs> and then you're just like, and I'm sure, like, I'm sure most people who, whether it be with whichever chat that you're in, have that relationship, right? Where it's like, you've read something, and you're like, I got this. And it's like, wait a minute, what the fuck did I just consume <laughs> for the past few hours? Um, yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, the only other thing that I, I know that I've done sometimes is like kind of spree to read through a book once and then go back for a second time because sometimes you get a bigger picture. Like, you know what the author is building up towards and you're like, ah, oh, this quote's shit. I'm going to get the better quote later sort of thing. Um, yeah, especially when you're digging in alternative ideas, right? Because I did drop I did drop a, a very um, controversial gentleman. <laughs> and something that I think is incredibly valuable is, is reading texts of those alternative ideas. Because something that I think can happen is because I've run into it myself where you, you think you've thought out an argument and like a, a position that you advocate for, but then someone can ask you just a really basic question and then you're just like, fuck. <laughs> and, and, and that and it's, yeah, and it makes you go for it, sorry. No, 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 no. I, I was just going to agree with that. There's something, I totally forget the name for it, but this is something I've referenced myself, is that um, it's this concept that it's very hard, very, very hard to critique your own ideas, um, because you think that your ideas are perfectly logically sound. Usually, you're like, I, you know, what I believe is right. I'm sure everyone on this panel thinks that what they believe is right. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't think it. Um, so the question is, how do you critique it? And the answer is, are, you, you need to get a perspective from someone else. And so literally debates can be useful for that if they are productive, if they are substantive. Um, so like that's literally from an epistemic perspective, the arguments for debates and for conversations. Um, yeah. And then and maybe one thing that might be happening, and this might be why Twitch panels are so popular right now, is that we don't really have spaces to, to challenge our ideas with our ter alternative thoughts. Where sometimes you might think like, yeah, like supporting black people's pretty based. And then you'll just run into to a so, doobie of the world and you're like, what mm -hmm. the fuck are these arguments? <laughs> and, and then I you're, think and it then very much like, lays yeah. bare the assumptions that you're making when you're forced to deal with someone who questions like literally all of them. Like you aren't just debating with leftists who are like, I'm going to question you two, three chains of logic. It's like six layers down. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just because, I mean, one thing that I, obviously I'm a music teacher and one thing that I, I try to really internalize with my students is, and, and this goes back to what I was saying about owning your text is like, you have to hey, own your music. Going well. and sometimes like, some of my students will play something like really, really good. Like I have a student right now who's working on, um, Prelude, Fuge and Riffs. Um, I'm just name dropping. No one fucking knows how it is. Anyway, they're working on a song that's pretty fucking <laughs> difficult. And, and one of the problems is I tell her all the time, like I, I hear, I hear Benny. I don't hear you. When I mean Benny, I'm talking about Benny Goodman. And it's like, I can hear the people we that are. she is referencing as guidance, but I, I don't hear her and her playing. And then she keeps saying like, but but it's so hard. And it's like, it, mm -hmm. it, I would argue that it's the easiest thing is being yourself. And sometimes when we're in the, in the risk of like studying things, we might lose ourselves in the study. Cause it's almost like, um, I would describe it as like a starvation for knowledge. Like when you're first learning about something, you just want to like eat, 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 eat. And then it's like, I'm full, but I, I can't even like replicate what I ate. Like I couldn't like, you know what I mean? That makes sense. I know I, maybe this, so I don't want to get too far into just kind of going over this again and again, but something I really like from, uh, the God King James Medlock is just when they read an interesting study, they'll post something on Twitter about it. Um, it's the same sort of thing where it forces you to recontextualize and repersonify what you're talking about. You Medlock aren't just consume, person. consume, consuming. You aren't just eating, eating, eating. You also have to actually replicate it a little bit and summarize it for someone else. Um, so I think it also has the benefit of sharing it with other people. And now they can consume, consume, consume. Yeah. And then I think um, as much as people want to push back on this idea of like why are you reacting to other people's videos flash demon mama like why don't you just do your own content if anything like i would Some say beta shit yeah <laughs> <laughs> i would argue that like there, there's a level of that like there, there's something to be had about hearing other people 
advocate for things and then just like okay based on everything that i've internalized how can i how can i counter this because sometimes you'll you'll go especially like again not to again i'm really deep in soul right now because one of the things that soul does which i think is really hard to tackle in real time is he'll give true you just reminisce. enough information there's for no what way he's energy. saying is true but you know there's ascended. bullshit i'm a and then the question is like okay where is that bullshit for someone like a like a candace owens it's like okay there's, there's clearly some bullshit here it's just it smells it fucking reeks but then you have like the the semi how you would say the um is this milk bad i think it's bad like do you know what i'm trying to say seo vash like you know what i'm trying to allude to kind of if that makes well sense? i think it's i just really quickly i think it's about an attempt to maintain aesthetic purity for a lot of these people there's nothing ideologically weighted about responding to other people's content or doing blood sports or doing debates as opposed to this or that or this or that a diversity of tactics is essential if we want to win i agree and conservatives know that which is why they did all of it and why they're much larger and more powerful than us certainly online at the very least because they knew that but the idea that i don't know for me personally advocacy should be about meeting people where they are lenin believed that too and the fact of the matter is that people are not at theory review videos there's a small market for that at best people are here for drama and violence which is all by the way they have ever been for for all of human history that is what people are for always well that and sex but we can't sell that on youtube um Debatable. And if we want to meet people where they are a little bit if we want to meet people where they are if we want to win if we want to convince people we have to speak to them in languages they appreciate this isn't just some like oh the humble proletariat isn't intelligent enough to etc cetera, etc cetera. i don't like theory analysis videos i sit through them because i have to for my job i like blood sports i like when angry people yell at each other until the forehead vein pops out i just like that <laughs> and i engage with ideas a lot better when i'm hearing them in that format too which is why my content is what it is. So yeah, this this isn't even like a class distinction thing. It's just people like this. Why? What's wrong? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with providing? Yeah, I don't think there's anything. In fact, I think there's only. Nothing. I think there's good things. I do. I do believe that there are uh, things to be cognizant of. Uh, you know, I think that it's possible for you know individual creators to find themselves creating content they don't like or pulled into the algorithm chasing or whatever. Um, but like I said before, like I I think that it would be great and I would celebrate if there were ten more lefty cooking channels that talk about politics once for every twenty re recipes that they cook on stream. Um, that would be amazing and it would also I don't know I feel like it would it would alleviate a lot of the stressors that already exist in in some of the space in, in some of the spaces that currently exist and also i i tend to have um you know i mean people know i really got my start in streaming doing debate panels which people have a lot of like some people online have a lot of really bad things to say about debate panels but i think a lot of it is more about like setting the expectations at least for me my audience knows what they're coming to my show for. They know they're not coming here to be uh, to be taught a, well, okay, maybe once in a while, have some like deep philosophical conversation. But for the most part, it's going to be for entertainment. There's going to be hopefully some edifying and valuable things there, just like how you can watch a documentary that's super entertaining and learn a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and I do believe that there's room for more like, you know, uh, granular content and whatnot, of course, obviously. But I, I think that there is, um, and again, I, a lot of this is mostly on Twitter. I, I, I point at Twitter a lot, but there's this idea of the holier than thou, the the aestheticization that, that Vosh mentioned that absolutely does play a part. I just think that we should be more willing to embrace those shows that are going to talk about issues in ways that everyone understands. Because, quite frankly, uh, it's not a matter of, uh, of intellect at all. Uh, like... Uh, I, I have spent much time reading lots of books. I just, I don't really like reading theory that much. Personally, I've enjoyed some pieces of theory, but I don't do it all the time. And and also, I left religion. I didn't, like, I didn't leave religion to come in and be told, okay, well, now you need to study a new book of 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 of, of holy laws that need, that if you don't understand these, well, then you're de surely destined to sin. And I'm just like, no, like, that is not, I, I, I critique that. I 
there's a reason why I don't think like dogma um, is very helpful in that way. Um, obviously, you can learn from all kinds of things. And I will point out that much like you can learn from theory, you can also learn from religious texts. Um, even as a leftist, um, you may not learn as much, but you can certainly learn from it. And I think that we need to remember that a lot of um, I'm very much a believer in the idea that that people can can both communicate and understand pretty complicated topics as long as you're speaking the same language as them. And sometimes that means uh, you you have a bunch of pepes on your screen. And sometimes that means you have uh, a million gifts on your screen or you make jokes about Fortnite or whatever. Um, I think that can be a way to reach people. And I think we should embrace that. Yeah, I think that that's a common thing. Like uh, I'll watch panels for... 20 30 minutes sometimes the last one i jumped on I, I was watching for an hour and they all were disagreeing for the longest time and it was really annoying because they were all kind of saying the same thing but they like none of them could articulate it in a way to where the others were able to understand and i think it is like a i think it's just kind of a gift where some people are able to explain things in a way to where others can understand Better. So I'm not going to be able to get into like a great conversation with Joe Lewis where he's going to have this like uh, sometimes like the, the academia stuff that he'll go over just goes way over my head. Right. But once I understand it, I can Bruh. teach it very well. <laughs> I don't. I'll, yet, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Uh, I'll go. I, but I jumped into that panel after about an hour. And within two minutes, I had all of them agreeing with just by giving a couple hypotheticals and all of them were like, oh, yeah, that's true. OK, yeah, we all agree. What what, what did I say, Joe? Yeah, yeah well, no, I think to, to your point, I mean, Samantha, <laughs> Samantha and I um, are refugees from a conservative panel um, <laughs> that we both got out. That we both got. I, was, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I was called a slur. OK, I. <laughs> I was I was called many more slurs than you, Joe, and I got the death threats well, for three well, hours. My, but mine has People has, has, has a historic, sometimes. Yeah, I know, it's, it's a cold world. I guess my point is, um, <laughs> like what I'm trying to get at is within this within this panel or this stream of qu in question, one of the problems that that Samantha ran into, I ran into, which which harkens to Vash and Dimamo's point is that you'll lose people on just def basic definitions. And then what happens is you got to like, you got to switch it up where it's, you, I can't use whiteness on everyone. It just, it's not possible. And then what sucks about it is that I have people in my own spaces that say, well, you can't reject the definitions. And it's like, sure I can. We do it all the time. Like we, we, we change our language for so many things. Like there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to change it to make sure we get people into understanding what we're saying. Because like, sometimes I, I love like, I, I made the mistake of following a lot of MLs on Twitter and something that happens is that <laughs> they're just like, that's all the product of the booze, wants the white supremacy. And it's like, bro, no one gives a shit. I love you, but no one gives a fuck. And, and then like you say that, and it's like, of course they give a fuck. Like, bro, they literally think you're a fucking tanky. Like there's gotta be a better way that you can relay your ideas in a way that, that just levels you and does it make, and does, I don't know how to word the thought, but like sometimes, God damn it. Like quit using who, terminology from theory that was written almost a hundred years ago to apply in a modern day fucking setting. Well, yeah. I mean, boring, I, and you look like a fucking weirdo. And by the way, they don't do this. Okay. When Sargon of Akkad was pulling people over to the right for six years, he, well, now he does, but back then he never sounded like he was quoting from triumph of the will. You know, they don't do when fascists get along in their little pedophile discord circle jerks or whatever, and they talk about, you know, strategy, they are not talking about reiterating the the rhetorical and, you know, semantic uh, processes of the Third Reich. They don't do that. They never they just, they just say shit that people will listen to. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all the thought they have to put into it. And um and they're they're better for it. They're infinitely more successful than they would be otherwise because of that. Hey, we're oh. gonna go to Demon Mama next. Kay, check your messages. Yeah. Um I, I there was just one thing I wanted I to say, which is that um I do think that there is a time and a place to like pull pull out some of the big it, larpy language from time to time but it has to be used carefully like i mean this is the thing right like 
um, that we talk about the existence of a of a right wing pipeline, and this pipeline starts with um, you know 4chan. It starts with like 4chan humor, and then slowly they leak in the oh the Deus Volt stuff, and then all of a sudden you hear yourself listening to Steve Bannon, and before long you're l consuming Christian Dominionist speeches where they're literally like we must extend the the rightful western empire of christianity to where it once extended to let let the sun never set on god's will and all this shit like that and like that that sort of emotive larpy stuff can be effective but you can't like front load that all the time you really can't and there is room for like i mean like i've listened on stream to like um this really w wonderful um lefty uh, play, uh, called The Last Ship, um, and it's wonderful, it's done by Sting, and it's, like, amazing, and it has all of this music, there's, like, a whole song that's about, like, the Union guys, and they're, like, singing, and it's got a lot of that language and stuff, and it's amazing, but it has to be, you have to know, you have to be able to read the room, is what I'm saying, and a lot of this is just not the case, I mean, god, there's, like, entire channels that are just devoted to just empty, empty LARPing that is just, plainly alienating to a lot of people and then it is also packaged as superior to all other types of rhetoric and i i think that that is is very unhelpful personally oh yeah and every profession like just so i'm clear about this because it does like some people would would like listen to what we're saying it's like oh you anti-intellectualism it's like no like as you mentioned demon mama it's like read the fucking room as as a Again, like one of the things that I do outside of this space is event production, and and one of the things People that I are saying that um, the player crashed and Tom Fleury seems to be frozen. Oh, did the player? Crash? Uh oh, there he goes. Sorry, I didn't before you got. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah, maybe you'll come back. He'll okay. be back. Well, I'll take care of this from now on. <laughs> He'll be back, guys. Watch, Don't worry. Kind of cat is I've never seen a cat like that before. What kind of, what kind of the one that I showed that? earlier? Pigeon. Yeah, yeah pigeon. The uh, she's a sphinx cat, no hair. Oh shit. Yeah, my um god, I think it was my sister that had a sphinx cat way way back. I just remember being hairless. This was like when I was mad young. Um I hear they're really I hear they're great though. Yeah, they're awfully cute. Real affectionate too. I mean, they're ugly little goblins, but if you can get over that, they're real cute. Uh I mean, it makes no. it makes hair management pretty easy, right? Just they are hypoallergenic. Yeah. Well, yeah. kinda. They're in the ballpark. Mm. Tom's back. So but Tom is working on getting back up and running. Yeah. Oh, we're, yeah. we're still we're still back live. live. Oh, nice. It, it is still live, just having some issues. Oh, okay. Oh. Gotcha. Gotcha. So even me coming into the the communist space, I, I found that. Um, running into a bunch of the mls on twitter was like one of the worst things i ever fucking did in my life um um and then i and i found out recently what the true tankies are like and i will say that i i would much more rather be blown up in afghanistan all over again than spend 30 seconds talking to infrared I, w I did it warn everybody that I was going to be ableist before I was even on the call. Um, then they got mad about that. But then I woke up to 100 personal messages on Twitch and 200 what? personal messages on Twitter from a bunch of angry fucking tankies, wow. um, which was even worse than the attack I got from DGG people when I yelled at Destiny telling Destiny that his community is fucking problematic sometimes with a pattern of transphobia. So tankies are weird. Internet, I, I will man. say, um, I, I still have a, a a a standing offer out to um, to infrared, not to undercut you, Vosh, but uh, it is only right now only one hundred and eighty five dollars to secure your debate with Demon Mama. Right now, infrared, if you or the Gorilla Gang or whatever you call your group are watching, uh, one eighty five if you use the discount code eighty five D two D Derek. So uh, the referrer, of course. So feel free. So uh, much cheaper I'm, than the other people. I'm they still call like the Gorilla Gang. That's such. I'm still new here and, and what, what I'm they ended up hard my phone that, number somehow uh, like there's so many people and then like like as an example right like i talked to destiny like months ago and then people started calling me budget q and i'm like who the fuck is q and then i had to like and then it took me like even like like weeks to figure out like, like who are these people that i i don't know i guess it's like 
there's a level of dedication thank that people you, Serene have Sensei. to this space. Thank you so much. And, and I never know how how deep it goes sometimes. I, I don't know, man. No, brother Q. Andre Domis. I'm glad I'm not the only one that has this problem because, like, I'm not a streamer. I'm not a content creator. So, like, it's, my, all my conversations with Tom are like, so we're having this person on on Wednesday. Do you know who that is? N no, no, I don't. <laughs> no, but see, but Kay, then you fuck up. Like, I fucked up when um, I underestimated John Burke's power level. And then, like, I made I made a comment, like, on a panel about how, like, he, he's, like, right, right, he should probably, like, give the women on the panel a bit more space to breathe because they weren't talking and then like john berg dunked on me so goddamn hard i was like you know what i deserve that but at the same time it's like sometimes i get nervous like i don't under like these power levels of some people like they mask it in conversations and they joe, just like, you... what's up joe defending women how dare you i know it's a cold <laughs> world out there Oh, thank you so much. Power level thing is hilarious. Like, I, I was doing a foreign policy discussion one time, and someone asked me what my experience with Korea was, and I was like, I did like a two-year uh, like research assistant study, like on like economic and geopolitics on the Korean Peninsula. And it was like, it was really like some like you never know, honestly, especially online, you, you never know someone's like credentials or like capabilities until they start talking about it, because like someone could just be shit posting the entire time, and all of a sudden they're like, no, I actually have like a master's degree. It's like, well, fuck me. Yeah, I think the best the best was um. I was, I'm in this Facebook group of all the, like, just, just like my entire townships on this Facebook group. And somebody was getting into the argument with the mayor and she kept saying over, like, it's basically like a stream of, of talking about the, like, basically the, our mayor was talking about stuff, but this woman didn't understand that the, the person that she was antagonizing was the mayor. So she kept saying like, this person is just so ridiculous. How does he even think this is how our township works? Like, does he even like understand uh, how taxes probably another work hour and, and half like or so. And then he just kind of paused and he's like, I have to stop and remind people that I am actually the mayor of this township. And then I'm just like, oh, shit. <laughs> and it's funny, too, because, like, there's two sides of it, right? There's the side of, like, people just don't know who the players are. But then one side that I'm learning the hard way is, like, there's so many players on this on these teams. So many. Um, it's, it's great, but fuck, man. Okay, yeah. but that's where the permanent revolution by, uh, like, Trotsky's beliefs can come into play. Apparently, like, that, that was a meme. power went out on... My whole block. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so Happens. real quick, I, yeah, I got some stuff I still got to fix. Um, but uh, Hans, can you – well, actually, Kate, can you go into the next topic for for everybody? Uh, Tom, I'm on my phone. Like, I don't have anything pulled up. Okay. Uh, Hans, you want to do the decommodification? Yeah, sure. For me, but thank of course. You. No problem. Uh, so uh, – the other question that uh, Tom wanted to bring up was specifically uh, two of the most basic tenets of socialism, right? And this is what most like everyone here on this panel like claims to be: are decommodification and workers owning the means of production. So uh, we'll start. We can start decommodification and then move to like worker stuff uh, if we finish that quickly. Hey, so the basic question for everyone on the panel is: what do you think should be decommodified, and what do you think is most uh, to least important on that list? Like you know, give like your list of like you know. Uh, it could be one thing, it, it could be eight things in terms of what you think should be commodified, in what order you do them, and like why you would pick that specific order. Is it like, is it, because it's easy, because like it's the, what's most important to you. Uh, everyone, uh, feel free to go. Go ahead. I'll uh, come in at the end, unless. I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, housing, education, healthcare, um, water, big one right there, water, um, and medication. The, from my from my head yeah um... i mean so the the question of what you decommodify uh the answer is usually you want to look at things with, where people reach satiation meaning that um you if you provide free health care there's not too much evidence that people like insanely over consume health care same for water um so there's less of a risk of people like really abusing something when you decommodify it i.e bring it closer and closer to being free at the point of service um so that's like some of the easy stuff. Like water is an example. Um, healthcare is an example. Um, somewhat education, people could theoretically spend a long time there. There might need to be like limits there. Um, but I think that the other idea here is conversely, that's like the satiation argument. The other argument is um, 
just from like a cold hearted economic perspective, what benefits the economy? And we have a lot of evidence that markets underinvest in research and development. We have evidence that they underinvest in education and other human capital improvement. So there's a huge reason for the state to get involved in education and in other sectors like these and like enormously boost investment um, because it will improve the economy for everyone, not just like the workers. Yeah, you're also looking for industries that don't respond healthily to the supply demand curve. Uh, if a um, if there's an inelastic uh, demand uh, that, that doesn't respond very healthily to uh, the cost of supply, then it's probably not going to benefit very much from a market incursion. I mean, healthcare, for example, you know, how much money would insulin have to cost before a diabetic person would decide not to buy it? I mean, it'd be infinite. They they would they'll die. They they'll indebt themselves for life if they can continue living. Um, so obviously the market system just doesn't work too well there. And there's plenty of really, really good info on that. I think one of the things that a lot of lefties don't like biting this bullet either, but because there's this whole like, you know, instant seize the means of production, instant decommodify thing, is that one of the big problems that previous attempts at socialist countries have faced is that if you cut yourself off from the global trading block, you lose a lot of geopolitical power that puts you at the underhand in, in future conflicts that will almost certainly arise because you just went socialist uh, there are now people mad at you. Um, if you like, if you cut yourself off from the the neoliberal trade block in the world right now and everything that goes on in it, then you are putting your country at an unbelievable disadvantage. Geopolitically, you're going to skyrocket the cost of whatever commodities you're still purchasing for the people in your country. There might be shortages or outright famine in some cases. And all of that comes if you do not properly structure your decommodification. You need to make sure that other economies are still dependent on you and that you're still dependent on other economies because that's the number one best way to avoid warfare in the modern world, to make sure that both countries would economically suffer if either were to attack the other. And if you can manage that, I think you can get away with decommodifying quite a bit. You just have to make sure that you do it in a way that doesn't stir needless unrest something i've been kind of working on is just so like I, I don't know man like i just want it's pretty simple i just want community control of economic frameworks to produce goods and services sorry that retail and produce goods and services excuse me and and one of the problems that like i think it gets lost in the sauce is again that everybody lives in a community and your communities are going to have different needs different desires and what have you and and so you have like your local needs and desires then you have your, your county needs and desires which then extends to your district to your state your tri-state area and then the federal at large and and like things that i've been kind of eyeing on within my community is just more business within the community so i've been having a really close eye on hr 4999 which Again, for those of you who don't know any, who's watching, who don't know anything about this bill that I'm talking about, it basically revises the um, revenue, the internal revenue tax code in respect to opportunity zones. One of the problems that I have with opportunity zones, because my community suffered from it my entire life, is that you'll have large businesses coming in to communities and and giving. Um, these promises that they're going to, we're not going to pollute your lakes. We're not going to, we're going to hire workers in your, in your area. Like just, just trust, trust us, trust us, please. Like we're Walmart. You can trust us. When in reality, sometimes the, the levels that they are, they're going to, to contribute to the community is just dog shit. And so something that I want, right, is that I want businesses through community advisement and oversight to make a conscious, dedicated effort to invest in their communities through things like employment, community infrastructure investment guarantees. So what that looks like in my township, because my township has this, is that every business that opens has a percentage of what they earn that's gonna be guaranteed to be given back into the community, however it may, however like the community decides what that is. I think respectfully it should be higher, a higher percentage, but like that's one thing that I, I would really like to see within my community. I think a lot of communities could adopt something like that. And then another thing is just, um, just environmental reports and committees for environmental reports. So we can really have a better job at analyzing overburdened communities where sometimes that happens because Jersey plagues this is that you'll have an area like Newark where it's very, very much, it's, it's incredibly overburdened and any business that comes in there is walking into a fragile infrastructure environmentally, but they just like these companies go in here, mostly like medium sized oil, medium sized developments 
and they just put a giant sickle through it. And thank God we finally passed a bill that prevents this from happening, where com communities have to, sorry, excuse me, businesses have to show through an environmental report that they are not going to, whether it be increase emissions or even add more to the pollution within the, that community. And I think that every township would benefit greatly from that. Now, is this going to affect some of like the, the smaller quote unquote businesses in certain industries? Absolutely. But I don't think it's going to be at the scale that people are worried about because in part there isn't really, there is research on this, but a lot of communities don't really, sometimes they don't care. And that really concerns me where they just allow a business to come in here because there are no jobs. But then in reality, you'll still have the same unemployment problems when the mall Mart was there before versus after, or, or like they'll have one supermarket that, that hails for the, the entire tri community or the tri County area. And that to me is unacceptable where I think we have to one, find a way to incentivize people business to come in because sometimes your community can't build it from within, but also make sure those businesses that come in are part of that community in a way that, that that's fiscally viable and also just socially viable as well. There's, I can talk about this for hours, I'm sorry. So I'm gonna cut in before Demon Mama tries to go again. Um, I just wanted to say a brief thing linking what you and Vosh said. Um, you mentioned about giving back to the community and Vosh talked about not immediately being able to like decommodify everything. So one of the linkage institutions that I think about um, is social wealth funds. You don't necessarily need to directly decommodify a good for the profits of that good um, and the, the ownership of that good to be placed into social hands, um, either directly via nationalization or indirectly via, again, a social wealth fund, which is where the state would like buy a shares in a company um, even if it allowed it to operate more or less as it did regardless. And then payouts from that social wealth fund could be provided to people so they would benefit from um, like production in their community. So it's like a stepping stone, I guess, is the idea. Yeah, yeah. And then last thing, and I'll shut the fuck up. Like, I live in Jersey. Our taxes are high as fuck. So I want to make that incredibly clear. I also live in one of the most affluent areas in the entire United States. And one of the things that I, I'm noticing is mod. of concern is that they're... They, the people in my community don't give a fuck about the outside world, but they care about little things within their community. And sometimes you just need a little bit of a nudge to under, to, to help p push people in that direction, right? Because one thing that this community doesn't have is a, is a center. We don't have a center. We have a sort of center that drives like business and commerce. But then in reality, like when people are no, complaining in, in this township saying that like, well, our businesses are clear, failing, like all these our businesses in our township are failing. And then I, I call out and it's like, listen, everybody, like we don't have a lot of businesses here in the first place that produce goods and services that this community needs or wants. So of course they're going to be failing because the, the need of like this idea that the outside community has to come in to create profit to me is just it's it's a it's a failed dream and then they go like well what do you mean it's like well because of covid we can't have people from outside communities coming in so if you have an infrastructure that can survive without outsiders driving business then of course they're going to do a little bit better you know yeah um I mean, a lot of most of what I was going to say has been touched on in some form or another. Um, I mean, I think the, the the quick and easy answers are are healthcare and and housing, which I, like America is in, in dire straits when it comes to housing, and uh, that's especially visible in places like where I live, which is Seattle, which has one of the highest rates of homelessness in the country um, for a. a, a, a complicated number of societal reasons um but i think something that like hasn't been really touched on here that i think is super important um and i'm sure there are some people who might scoff at this but i really want people to think about it is the internet um i i think that the internet is something we should very seriously decommodify it is if you really think about it it is a a it is the the nervous system of the, the the human race. We're able to immediately communicate with one another in a way unlike we've ever been able to do before, and that is so important. Everything from from general education to learning languages to understanding what's going on somewhere else to being able to transmit weather data to uh, being able to just connect with one another and find other humans like you who are important to you. Uh, it is 
so unbelievable what the internet has allowed us to uh, achieve and what the potential is for the future of the internet. And I think that sometimes it gets neglected. I, I think that we're going to see that, um, you know, countries and 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 communities that that choose to make the internet a right are going to be able to excel in ways that we didn't even think was possible the internet makes it possible for people to receive top-notch world-class education in their own home um if it's decommodified and so i i really 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 think that like uh, it's something that I want to be talking about a lot more in the future is how we can actually functionally get to that point. Um, I do happen to think that um, it's going to be a little bit hard for us to get there in this country because we have severe issues with uh, monopolies uh, when it comes to the internet. But I think that's all the more reason for us to begin talking about it in a very serious way. We are hindering ourselves by not providing the internet to everyone who can possibly get it and making the internet better for everyone who can get it. Um, I recognize that, of course, the internet poses some risks, as we've seen with the spread of COVID denial and whatnot, but I think that if we are able to give everyone access to the internet, we are going to be able to actually approach that on equal footing, and the potential for the enlightenment of all people in so many different directions makes this r r so important. And I always say, like, if you had to think about like a, a part of your body that you wouldn't wouldn't want to live without, the nervous system is going to be one of those that's pretty important. And the internet is what allows us to have instantaneous communication. So I think we should start to see it as vital as it really is. So, yeah. Yeah, I think a good place to start is, I mentioned this in a couple of panels ago, um, I think schools is the perfect place to start to to scale this up and, and COVID-19 pretty much exposed this problem. And what sucks about this is that some communities are not going to be able to have the funds due to the, the toxic relationship that property tax has in schooling. But in, in reality, there's a point where if there's a problem within a community, there it has to be up to the state to step in at a certain point. And then if the state cannot step in at a certain point, then the federal government has to assist. Like one thing that I'm really excited about in Jersey is that there's a there's a close the divide, like what they call it like closing the digital divide, which basically it's the the caveat or I guess the, the TLDR of this mission is that if you're in a public school in the state of New Jersey, you're gonna have access to the internet and a machine that gives you access to the internet so you can learn, period. And even despite this, this conscious effort, there are still students almost a year in, well now two years in, um, just still behind. And that to me is disgusting. And as much as like, certain districts in my state want to brag about how they have like oh we have a hundred percent internet access for our entire student body it's like i don't give a fuck about your 100 percent internet access if my capital still is in the sub 40 percent despite its population density then we're just a bunch of fucking losers and and again like yes this is going to be a long effort and a conscious that communities have to do but to, to demon mama's point like internet access and and the act and the the benefits that it gives are incredibly essential. And, but I think if we want to start somewhere into sh scaling this up, I think we we start with schools. I do agree with that. Hans, uh, you said there was some another part of it that you wanted to get to. Right? Oh yeah, the other thing uh, I have nothing really out of this. I would add electricity to the internet uh, to get make sure we all have like power so we can use the internet that demon mom was talking about uh for joe lewis uh universal education goes down like past like you know into preschool and then hopefully in higher education all that sort of good stuff uh and then uh the last thing uh that uh, about this was about you know, workers rights uh, workers are means of production uh, i think this might uh, help this uh be maybe a bit potentially more contentious or potentially uh, more like fruitful in terms of a uh, discussion uh, is to, uh, market socialism has like, come up a lot recently uh, as like an idea of like a modern uh, like possibility of workers owning the means of production just by having a bunch of worker-owned firms. Uh, do we think uh, that work that say uh, sorry that market socialism goes far enough? Do we feel like it uh, adequately uh, solves uh, the problems of capitalism? Should we go farther? Should we not? And what if what are the like flaws uh, so far? in that? So I think I'll you know throw it first to SDL on that, and then we can uh, just move around from there. 
I'm sorry. I, I was totally spaced out. Repeat the last part of that question. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Pay attention to me, man. What you doing? Uh, specifically, um, what are like, uh, do you think uh, market socialism goes far enough? Uh, do you feel like, uh, what are the potential holes in it that we'd have to correct? Uh, should we uh, do more and all that? And is it, you know, all that sort of stuff. So just uh, go off. Um, I mean, so I think the, the, the two answers are, um, so I think that like the ultimate goal of most people here is like living in a communist utopia where communism probably requires something like post-scarcity. We were talking before about satiation goods. Um, and so at a certain level of production, goods increasingly become satiation goods. Like before in, in human history, food was not a satiation good, neither was water because people literally didn't have enough of it to survive. Now we produce more than enough. Um, so we are increasingly, as production increases, uh, reaching the point where we get to that for more and more goods. It becomes more and more possible to decommodify. Um, so long as scarcity exists, that possibility does not exist. So the answer of like, is socialism far enough is no. Um, I think like in short, um, you want to increase production. Uh, it, you know, th this is totally uh, ignoring all the ecological and like other impacts of production, but just like increase production in general so that people can decommodify more things and have access to more goods. Um, does market socialism in particular go far enough? Um, well, apparently you're market socialist now, so you would agree with me. Um, it seems like, um, so to me, socialism means the overarching concept is economic democracy. Um, it's the idea that people should be able to, like the people as a, as a whole and people within workplaces, people within communities should be able to determine um, the economic conditions that they live in. And de and like the, the goal of socialism as political advocacy is to take power mostly from like the, the very rich, um, the people who disproportionately have that power and transfer it more horizontally to more and more people. So I think market socialism does so well um, for two reasons. One is that it, it does like the decommodification, it does the Nationalization. It does um, a lot of what we're talking about for certain types of goods, um, but for other goods where we still need to increase production, where we really care about efficiency and so on, it does seem like you need competition to improve oh, wow. the ability to produce because competition produces innovation and in turn innovation increases the ability to produce things more efficiently, lower ecological impacts and further get closer to the commodification goal. So I know, I know that was a very long answer, but in short, it's like a good enough for the short term because we can't get to the long term unless we have more efficiency. We need market socialism to get efficiency to get to the long term, which is communism. I'm sorry for spree. Yeah, I'd like to jump in. <laughs> oh, no. I think it's a stupid question. Does it go far enough? We're decades, optimistically, away from anything even approaching what we would call market socialism. And that's if we're lucky. I mean, really, really lucky. We don't just nosedive into fascism. They don't have these conversations. The drooling monkey fascists in their little planning meetings don't talk about, well, do we want to expel all of the Jewish people or do we keep a small number of them or do or we're talking full extermination or what? They don't have these, these weird conversations about what systems or projects they're trying to build at the end. They talk about what they can do now, or at the very least, what rhetoric pulls people to the right now. It's just weird to me. I just, there was a, a comment that came up in chat like a second ago. I just saw it. These MFs talking about market socialism when they couldn't even get the $15 an hour minimum wage. I think it's really important to keep where we are in perspective, because there are a lot of lefties online who actually get caught up in this discourse. Is market socialism enough, or is this just rad liberty? Is this just, just capitalism, more capitalism? What about full communism? Can we even get there? Oh, nothing less than that specifically is acceptable to these people. And it's like, okay, come on. It's good to know what you want to move towards. I think that's important. I do, by the way. I think market socialism is a good idea. And what's more, I think that a lot of the decisions that we'll make after that point will be contingent upon whatever we discover in between now and the invocation of such a system. We don't know what the material conditions of a society 50 or 100 years in the future is going to look like. Nobody 50 or 100 years before now ever could have guessed where we'd be at now. Nobody could have guessed that. We're in a moon land compared to where we were 50 years ago. So why should we assume that we should make prescriptions for our future selves? We don't know. All we know is what we think can work now. And I think market socialism, if applied effectively, could work now if we could snap our fingers and make it happen. You know, of course, we can't do that. It's a long and grueling road ahead, but it could work now. It's a good template. It's a good base to work towards. And then if we want more, we can move when we get there. But even then, conversations like this selective decommodification, worker ownership of the means of production. I like these conversations because they help us know what we should be moving towards, but I don't hear these conversations, you know, I, I would like to hear conversations about unionization more often, or I don't know, getting more uh, progressives into the Senate 
stuff like that. Because unless we have conversations about the means by which we might arrive at a better system, the pontificating about a better system is just jerking off. We aren't actually getting anything out of it. If anything, we're priming people for a lot of disappointment, you know? They get all hyped up. Oh my God, look at how good the world can be. But you, you, oh, whoop, you didn't build a ladder, you know? So we never actually get to go to that world. We just get to stay in this one. Does that make sense? The no, question no. doesn't go far enough. Has always rubbed me the wrong way. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, if, like specifically for that question. The, the reason why, uh, like, we phrased it as we did is because Chad this panel's is like full of socialists, and it was Tell supposed him. to like be a, like a deeper dive, like into like that specific thing. Again, I'm sorry if that's like. Wait, wait, wait! I'm not, I'm not, I'm not offended at you or anything like that. I'm not the trying question, to. That, that's the question was well posed. This is this is my response <laughs> to the question. I think it's important to contextualize whatever intra left discourse we have on that type of subject Damn. you know okay and then uh if we want to like move past that then uh you, you, like i I'm, i think no, 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 i'm not, oh, yeah, I'm not trying to shelf the subject i'm only saying that is my response to it other people <laughs> can believe what they want That's... i i have one minor uh disagreement with vosh though i do agree that uh on the right they do tend to sort of focus more on how they can get their victories um i will say that all you need to do is listen to a little bit of steve bannon talking about his um ideal formulation of a young white men's christian militia uh to restore to you know literally bring a new crusade to europe um to realize they do also pontificate about their ideal worlds um and again religious that's especially true when you talk about the religious right they talk about heaven on earth and god's kingdom and all of these things all the time that's just it's a very minor disagreement but i do think it's important to realize they they utilize that rhetoric very much so um you but you'd agree it doesn't take over their advocacy as much when oh, they're no. advocating they talk about how democrats are satanic pedophiles or whatever they don't go out there and talk about esoteric utopian you know economic systems that could only ever arise through 200 consecutive years of direct action yeah um, I, I think yeah. that that most of the time um their rhetoric in that way is is mostly confined to uh situations like um you know the groipers going and and talking about how sodomy won't win us the the culture war or whatever like that sort of thing they do do that sort of thing i think they do do some of that purity testing um nonsense but it, it tends to be in my experience much less so so i do agree with your overall take um it's it's just like i think it's because there's like a little bit more of the um without a better word machiavellianism on the right um if you believe that God is on your side, um, you know, and that, that you're going to literally bring back a, a crusade, like, I think that you're a lot more willing to say, yeah, I'll work with these people that I don't necessarily like, and I don't really need to voice it. I don't, I just would prefer if we get, you know, if we take over the Senate and then we'll go from there. Um, so yeah, I generally agree on that. With regard to the question of market socialism, I, I don't care um this is like no offense like i don't i don't mean that it's just that like i don't mean that i don't care at all about the question it's just that like everybody has their own little ideal system and their own uh thoughts i tend to believe that um that we are in for some very strange times and i think that some of these solutions um that we're talking about right now won't even be relevant in a couple of years as far as how we look at the structure uh like our economy is undergoing complete, like a complete change. We've got automation barreling down on us. COVID is a mess and we don't even know how long that's going to rage on for. Nobody has work. People are poor. People are increasingly homeless. I think we're going to see really, really big changes to the economy that's going to require us to uh, look less at like sort of specific frameworks for how we're going to build things and more at like the principles that we use to build something new that doesn't quite have a name yet. I don't know how... Uh, like we as a society are going to cope with the increasing uh, gig economy. The fact that more and more people make their entire livelihood, livelihood, including all of us, on yep, on the gig economy, um, where you have next to no uh, protections whatsoever and no ability to meaningfully organize. Um, I think it's going to be very strange if we see. Um, you know this increase this the increasing rhetoric on the right. I mean, I watched. Uh, a couple of like last week i i watched with my chat the the trump cpac speech where they were just like openly 
uh, espousing like America first, like literally an American, a previous American fascist movement, just literally just spewing that out all over the place. I think we're going into really weird times. And I don't know that like things like what we conceptualize as market socialism are even going to make any sense when we have an economy of like gig economy, micro gig economy, which is like, oh God, like there's so much you can look into with the here in 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 seattle there was this amazing this is a bit of an anecdote but here in seattle there was this article i read about people are will will finance uh phones like cheap smartphones that they can put outside of amazon delivery centers that they can use as a relay to be sure that they get the first deliveries in their gig delivery job and they will finance a smartphone to do that they will go into debt to be able to get access to work that you basically have to pay to do. You have to bring your car and all this nonsense. So there is competition to a level that we can't even – that we haven't even begun thinking about. And so I don't know. I am I guess when I think about these questions, I am looking at how maybe we can achieve uh, – survival together and thriving together and it might not look like trying to um like levy towards uh, larger I, I don't know i just i don't know about that so i i'm a little more interested in how do we like build up connections how do we get more people thinking about uh communal ways of living or cooperative ways of living if not um if not communal and that's, I think there's like, I don't know, maybe I'm a, maybe I'm like culture war poisoned, but I think that it's pretty important that we start having very honest thoughts about how we're going to actually like respond to a society that's looking more and more like we're going to be basically living in company towns in a couple months time, um, or maybe a year's time. It's, it's a little concerning. So I don't know if, uh, that was a long winded answer, but I, I don't know if I concern myself as much with the, those specific structures. Is it my turn to tackle this dumbass question? I'm just kidding. Oh. I'm just kidding. I'm a hurt. I mean, everyone else is welcome to provide questions as well. <laughs> yeah. I like, so this is why I advocate for community involvement, right? Like one of the things that I've, I found in the stuff that I do is that I, I love every parent that I've ever come in contact with in my community, but respectfully, they're not involved. <laughs> so what happens is you, you get sects of community, uh, sects, is that the word? I'm so fucking stupid. You get collectives of community involvement, say at schools, right? So if you're in a school ecosystem, then the community, you can recreate like a community culture around that where the parents of, of kids be right become Bathroom. friends with each other or know of certain kids through through involvement in, in the community, whether it be at a local football game or, or, a, or just like some car wash. Then there's, when you scale that out, is that people's community involvement is based on sometimes their need to be involved in the community as, as much as that may sound like if you have a child and your child's in a school you're part of that school community whether you like it or not and something that i'm trying to to do here is just bully parents like there's so many parents in my township that are complaining about covid and i just asked them very honestly have you been to a board of education meeting and they're like well, why would I go to that just to hear the same thing that they're saying? Well, how do you know what they're saying if you've never been to one? <laughs> and then and then from there, it's like, okay. And I literally just, I bully, I bully the shit out of them. Where it's like, hey guys, the town, the board of education meeting is tonight. If you're going to complain about our superintendent getting a pay increase during COVID, then you should probably fill out an opening statement. I'm going to tell you the day before, so you have plenty of time to do that. And what I found is that unfortunately through like, I'm like, I guess like my philosophy on it is just bullying people to community involvement is that you'll get a few, right? You'll like, you'll get maybe like one or two, right? But then it permeates where something that was really kind of incredible to see is that at the last board of education meeting, as somebody who's been to every single one since COVID, there were 97 people in the call. And I'm like, holy shit, it's been like five for weeks. What, what happened? But then what happened was a bunch of parents were like, the survey's out. 
Did you guys hear that? The survey's out for, for opening for the next year. And then what well, all I did was just spam it in the Facebook group every day, sent messages to people. Hey, just so you know, the survey's out there. And then also there's a board of education meeting tomorrow. At this point, it was yesterday. So you should really like take the survey and let, and let just like let everybody know, just like, hey, do this thing. And then what happened was, which was really kind of incredible to me, as much as I don't like seeing my board of ed members, um, get grilled in an open hearing it's so cool to hear people's opinions and, and again like one of the things that that, I, that um some of my friends like do they say like well we got to seize the means of production and it's like sure i agree with you but we need to get involved if we're going to seize anything so get like getting True. involved in your community is True. that first step and sometimes it's hard as fuck but i would say that it takes one person to start dancing on a dance floor to get other people in right True. so sometimes you have to be that one person that's at the meeting every single day and I then just you. like saying hey this was covered in the board of education meeting hey this was covered in the boring township council meeting and i get it like Local shit's boring as fuck. It's so goddamn boring. Because what makes this magical, in my oh, opinion, I love Costco is pizza. that as much as they're, these are just people of the community. Like your township councils, your city councils are people True, who live in your area, hopefully. <laughs> like they're like, the, based on the rules that you have in your township, but that's a story for another day. Like I these are people in your community. Your board right of now. education members are usually parents of the community. And sometimes maybe your mayor, like in my case, he was the board of education president for seven years. He was part of the board of ed for 10 years. It took a democratic, in this case, a democratic mayor to not run and just retire for him to just sneak into that seat. And sometimes that's all it takes. Like being involved in your community can lead to political power I'm not in, in Colorado, your community, which then can scale outward, right? Like, and as much as like, oh, it is good. Which pains my heart to see my my old township where I used to grow up in struggling. One of the things that really frustrated me Someday, Vermin. is that soon there, COVID will be done. People would. The it's really easy vaccine. to complain about something, especially April, at the local April 26th. level, but you gotta like get out there and make sure that your complaining hits the ears of the people because my superintendent yesterday like as a savage he's like i'm not on facebook i'm not on twitter so if people are complaining on those sites i don't hear it i don't see it so the only way for you to see it is in this meeting and then lo and behold he learned the hard way that a lot of people showed the fuck up but that's kind of where I am in terms of just like, whether it be socialism or what have you, where it's just, I want people to be involved. And sometimes you gotta, you gotta just push them. You gotta just be like, Hey, just, just, just be a bully. And in a nice respectful way that respects their identity and all those great things, but just bully them in a way that, that force kind of forces the involvement. Like I'd rather someone being like, fuck you, Joe, I went to that board of education meeting and you weren't there. And it's like, cool. Maybe I was there in the chat. Woo! Like shit like that, you know? As a brief little thing, um, there was a comment. So y you guys probably know that the Nevada Democratic Party had this big turnover event where um, DSA slates got elected and they took control of the Nevada Democratic Party, which like left and sent all their money to the, I think it was like the state um, or the DCCC or something. Anyway, there was this big turnover where now the Nevada Democratic Party is apparently going to be run by DSA, which pog. Um, and on the whole note of like people focusing way on the far future and like purity testing the far future rather than focusing on today, someone said um, the Nevada Party was Democratic Party was not taken over by socialists. It was taken over by social democrats who still uphold capitalism. And social democracy is the moderate wing of fascism. So instead of like any organization, any like acceptance of like reform, you just get this sort of shit where any 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 reform less of like full communism is fascism is like just a total failure. So. Yeah, this is what I mean, by the way, about the aestheticization of political advocacy. Those people, the people who are saying that, are anti-working class. They don't give a single shit about socialism, communism, Lenin, Marx, Stalin, whatever. The only thing they care about is being leftier than thou. That's it. This social fascism theory has existed exclusively to the detriment of leftists for as long as it has existed. If your political theory, <clears throat> if your way of nice, looking at Miles. the world, is so inarticulate, so lacking True, in descriptive Jessica. utility that you cannot tell the difference between an honest to god fascist and bernie sanders you are lost you are utterly lost you are you are insane you've adopted the political equivalent of a mental illness you were removed from reality now you're gone you're floating in space the fact that anybody takes these ideas seriously is absolutely fucking beyond me 
honestly, social democracy is the moderate wing of fat. So, so all things are fascism except for total communism. And by the way, if you actually look at these people and follow their social media feeds, which you should never do unless you feel like you could benefit from a little more suicidality in your life, they are almost, to a man, massive fucking hypocrites. One and all. Either they don't adhere to the standards they set for themselves, or their definition of communism is state capitalism, which is quite a bit closer to fascism than anything Bernie Sanders advocates for. But Vosh, it's not it's not that they're not following it and they're hypocrites. It's they're gonna they're gonna use that we live in a society thing. That's what they're gonna respond with. Well and then, and then like and so does Bernie Sanders. It's also so it's so fucking fr- I, I guess I'm gonna pop off here. It's so fucking frustrating because there's just there's I don't know if it should be categorized as a mental illness yet, but but terminal Twitter online this is starting to drive me up a fucking wall where you'll see like a change like this oh is this chance. is objectively this great is for people and then you'll you'll the get some time. fucking mother it's dumb time. motherfucker who follows Mike from PA with a rose in their Twitter handle and they're like well actually this is so fucking bad because back in the, and it's like bro sh- how do you how do it's I get time. you to log my time off has come right now I would love just that don't, just don't <laughs> engage with people on Twitter you. why why would you ever engage with people on I, Twitter I personally Over Twitter usage should Wait, be in the DSM listen text. you all I can help you I can help you my community has this thing. It's called the imps code. Okay, we literally I I invented this specifically for Twitter It it cures this problem. Okay, I'm gonna tell you it all right now. I do this all the time I'm annoying with it, but still it's useful Uh, I was having a miserable time on Twitter So I sat down and spent like a week all the time thinking about this stupid thing and it's it's really simple There's four tenets of the imps code number one. I immediately stop discoursing Twitter is a discord is a discourse destroying machine Literally, I mean, it is systematically. It is algorithmically designed to tear apart context and promote the most spiciest thing. You could write an entire an entire essay, and the one tweet that might have something moderately spicy in it will become the most popular tweet. It will destroy your discourse. In addition, threading will destroy your discourse. So step one, I immediately stop discoursing. Part two, meme and cream. These are self-explanatory. Everybody knows what a meme is. Everybody knows what cream it is, okay? Memes do really well. Creams do really well on Twitter. They spread like wildfire. You find funny ass shit. You find horny ass shit. Enjoy yourself. Uh, three uh, is is P in the imps code, which is promote yourself and other people. T- uh, Twitter is literally an ad platform promoting you you or your friend's work, retweeting people that you like, whatever, goes super well on Twitter. Okay, and then number four, this is the important one, S, slaughter your genuine enemies in the arena of ideas. Now, when I say this, do not get these two confused with discourse. Discourse is when you're having a conversation with the hope of making some sort of progress. If you want to go and dunk on Ben Shapiro, somebody who is never going to have a conversation with you, is never going to respect you, will never be convinced by you, now that's the dunking. That's the slaughtering. Engage in that all you want. Use those people to to entertain others, whatever. If you find a dumb fuck that you want to blow out, just don't engage in discourse. If you want to engage in discourse, take it off Twitter. And if you learn the imps code, I promise you, you will enjoy Twitter so much more. It doesn't fix every single problem with Twitter, but it It will change the way that you engage with Twitter, especially if you follow rule number one. Rule number one, if you'll notice, is the only rule in the imps code that tells you what not to do. And the rest are things that you can do for fun. Um, So, yeah, the imps code literally has helped me come to actually enjoy Twitter. um, And I recommend people adopting. It's not a moral code. It's a handbook. So you don't have to feel bad if you break it. Yeah, I guess like the – because I come from – I came from doing this discourse on Facebook a lot because, again, if you're going – I don't know how many people know this, but if you're going into local politic and and understanding that more, Facebook is where it's at. That's where the people are, like the actual people who, like, can change your communities. But with that being said, it's interesting because on Facebook, I found that getting the people is a lot easier. I don't know if it has to do with the idea that there's a mutual understanding that we're part of the community when we're communicating with each other i don't know where that fits in here but um well i mean i think one of the reasons why uh facebook doesn't have the exact same problems with discourse that twitter does is simply because of it it's it's mechanical 
uh, Facebook threads things very clearly. You know who's responding to who. You can see it in order. On Twitter, you will frequently, depending on who you follow, you will frequently get snippets of a conversation. And in those, there will be sub-threads that actually, like, if you were to if you were to draw out the threads like on paper, they will break into sub threads where you will miss other things that might have been re in response to another tweet. So it's absolute chaos. It's actually like if you ever take the time to um, try and map out Twitter threads just as a mental exercise, you will go insane instantly. It's like um, it's like uh, bloodborne shit. You'll just your your insight goes to one hundred instantaneously, and um, it's it's so messed up. So like I think that fate there like the imps code doesn't work for every single website. Like, for example, it doesn't work for Twitch. Uh, it's really great to react and and uh, argue with one another and, and whatever on, on Twitch because it's different. It doesn't work for Discord because, well, on Discord, you can talk and you can have a history that you can follow the conversation for the most part, depending on the forum. But Twitter is uniquely... I feel like it's like uniquely torturous and I think part of it is because Twitter doesn't teach anybody how to use their own website because they don't care. It's an ad platform disguised disguising itself as social media. And mm -hmm. I do think there are aspects of like the imps code that can like be applied to other websites or be adapted to other websites, but Twitter is like uniquely Okay, maybe it's not completely uniquely bad because I think Tumblr had these same issues as well. Um especially with the threading Tumblr, anybody who ever used Tumblr will know that Tumblr threads were nightmarish. It was impossible to ever follow anybody's ideas through reblogging and all this stuff. Um, but I, I imagine that it would apply well to Tumblr if Tumblr still existed in any meaningful way. But yeah, for Twitter, like, you you can't. Even if you were in a Twitter area with lots of people you knew I, IRL, you're going to end up fighting with people just because of the way that it shows things to other people. So who's going to see it? Are they're going to see you arguing with one person? They're going to hop in. They're going to miss a whole bunch of comments, and they're going to get mad really fast. It is mm -hmm. nightmarish, and that's why I have like this little handbook, this little rule book for Twitter because it like it totally changes how you engage with the site. And I, I really feel like I wish that they would just brand themselves as an ad platform, but you, they know that it won't sell. So. Yeah. That is beautiful. Every word. I mean, my goodness, I, I'm new to Twitter and it is so frustrating. The threading. I never know what people are talking about, what they're responding to. Yep. It'll send me notifications if I have one person I follow talking to another person that I follow, but I don't know what they're saying. And then out of nowhere, like there's one that's like way bigger than all the others. And I'm not sure why it's way bigger than all the others or like, I, it's so confusing. It, it's driving me nuts. But the the character limit on Twitter makes it especially toxic for discourse. Whereas Facebook, like you can say as much as you want. I don't think I've ever gotten to a point where I've said too much. And it says like, you can't, you, you have, you've reached a character limit. And I say a lot, dude, like I, I want, I want to post, like I'm going into like multiple paragraphs every time. So I, it is Facebook definitely seems a lot better if you're actually wanting to learn or actually get into discourse or actually convince people um, than Twitter. All right. So for the, yeah, did you want to say something else? Oh, I was just going to say like to, to sort of wrap up that, that Twitter thing, like the, the character limit absolutely contributes um, because, but it isn't actually just the character limit because it's like, mm -hmm. you can write more, you can have multiple tweets, but then the threading mm -hmm. comes in. So it's like, you're, you're super locked into this, into the character limit. Which means, though, that there are ways to make political statements and political comments on Twitter um, that are effective, but they have to be able to fit within that character limit because the moment you start threading or or I guess you could have like a limited amount of threading, but the moment you start responding to people, you're done for. It's it's all sense is yep. gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I the last post born on my Twitter. That's what you should do. Welcome to Twitter. Yes. Okay. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yep. Um, yeah. Correct. So for the uh, last topic, um, everybody voted, and uh, by far the one that they want the most is they want to know: Are there any parts of conservatism as an ideology that you find useful for leftists? Um, are there parts like uh, tradition? that uh, you think would be useful or at least some things that you would find uh, that that it is consistent within conservatism that leftists could 
uh, could grab onto. I, I know Vasha, I think it was about a month ago, you had a point where you were talking about, um, what was it like responsibility or, or work ethic? You were talking about work ethic and your chat blew up and we're like, what? You sound like a conservative right now. How could you tell us we need work ethic? Like, are there things like this that you wish lefties were or leftists were, were better at? Yeah, it's to me, it's not so much that there are elements of conservative ideology that are defensible because I don't think that is that there are things that get roped up in the conservative aesthetic that I think are good. Um, so work ethic and was, discipline, I, I think, are incredibly similar. important. Now, there's nothing inherently conservative about that, by the way, at all. I mean, you, some of the most disciplined people in American history have been all the organizers and labor activists that have fought for our rights, you know, 50, 100, 150 years Probably back. Not and today, trans girl. that's discipline. There's nothing America conservative about it, but a lot of people associate it intrinsically with some, you know, this, this <clears throat> reflexive guilt that you know you're not doing enough that there's a maybe. moral need to uh prostrate yourself before the state which is not all of what discipline is i also think that um um community is pretty important now again that's not inherently a conservative value but conservatives tend to promote it a, mo a lot more than leftists do leftists like talking about community in the abstract um but usually like in, a, in an immediate sense, the way conservatives talk about community, whether that be church or family, uh, they tend to, I think, hammer on that a little bit more emphatically. They're more emotionally persuasive with it. So I think that's something we could adopt because, hey, people are lonely. And I think... Um, oh, I've talked about that before, Sugar. Again, there's nothing inherently conservative about this. But I think that uh, performative cruelty is something that people need to, if nothing else, can address that after to. Sugar Glass. Um, I don't think we're ever going to live in a world where people are all like super duper kind to each other. I don't even know if that's the world we're looking to push for. Some people, some behaviors, some tendencies don't warrant kindness. I don't know why that should be the goal. Fairness can be the goal, maybe. Um, tolerance, maybe, you know, you can make arguments for those things. But I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with being mean. There are a lot of lefties who I agree with have that. A, I agree with almost that, a reflection of reflexive aversion to, to mean tendencies or behaviors, which is really strange to me. I mean, what is the dirtbag left, right? There's a million definitions, but I, I think the general one is like they're edgy and they're OK being mean to people. But for God's sake, if the left is so obsessed with this point that you're willing to make an entire separate identifier associated with people who are performatively cruel the way everybody else is i feel like you might be dividing yourself over something utterly meaningless you know what i mean yeah. that's not to say we should all be cruel or Hoping mean or that we this. need to add more harm to the world uh, only that i think this is second, something Captain. that a lot of lefties send unnecessarily fixate on and often that can well, check it out be, be, make us look kind of weird and puritanical to a lot of people outside the lefty sphere that we're you know a bunch of shave-headed monks who walk around in robes with uh, a thousand qualifiers before every speech. And uh, we all have to be extra nice to each other because we're all very sensitive. Just these things, I don't, I don't think we need them. I don't think they benefit us in any way. And I definitely don't think they benefit the people who occasionally claim to benefit from them either. Sensitivity is a reflex, much like cruelty. You know, the more you uh, adopt it and feel comfortable expressing it, the more likely you are to do so again in the future. Um, and it's it's not good in either case, I don't think. Well, I think a so lot of lefties was... don't want to be like mean or performative mean or whatever because it, they might yeah. feel it's hypocritical when they're sitting here trying to promote like a, a society where a, everyone is better and happier, healthier, whatever. And and it seems kind of like um, hypocritical. I mean, me personally, I mean, I I don't ever think I could be mean or hurtful to anybody, um, even performatively. I'm just constantly kind always positive <laughs> words such a uh, lot <laughs> well that's you um well, well that's good i'm not arguing against the existence of people like you but there is no hypocrisy between wanting to make the world a better place and being mean along the way being well, good and nice is, two i think things. some of them that are are that way i'm not that way i'll fucking call everybody a bitch and, and like i'm i'm fucking problematic as fuck i don't give a shit mm -hmm. um but like i think a lot of them do think that like hey if i'm promoting this and peace and this i can't be this way 
um, when I'm, I like to use the being mean, not in a, a fucking performative thing, but like to just, I really don't fucking like conservative people. Um, and I use that as a coping mechanism to let them know how much I fucking can't stand them and I hate them. And I, I, I hope they step on a Lego at three o'clock in the fucking morning. It, it also, it also puts appropriate social pressures on people. Uh, being mean to people who engage in behavior you don't want disincentivizes them from engaging in that behavior. That's how all social pressure works, fundamentally. You know, if, if we stretch the meaning of the word mean a little bit, that's basically how it all you know boils down. And um, additionally, I think that there's actually a really strong rhetorical benefit to attaching cruelty to the right um, types of behavior. You know, This is something that I really like to do when I'm talking about issues like uh, incel dumb or, or like people who are on the far right but are maybe playing with the idea of moving over to the left. The idea is that it's okay to be cruel to you as you are now. It's okay to be mean to you as you are now, not because of anything that you are inherently, but because of the things that you've chosen to do and to believe. But the cruelty is entirely contingent upon your adoption of those beliefs because you're a Nazi, because you're I don't know, pro-rape or whatever the fuck these people are believing these days. But if you drop that, and you can, you're totally capable of dropping that, the cruelty leaves. It's not about you. It's nothing inherent. I think de-essentializing cruelty is really important because the right essentializes the fuck out of it. To them, they hate people for what they are, fundamentally. You know, race, gender, sexuality, that sort of thing. You know, that's, I mean, that's, you know, part of the whole package. So if you can show them that it's possible to mm. um, levy that that um, contempt in a way that's not only constructive, but actually um, reversible, I think it actually, it can be, I don't know, kind of a, a wow moment for some people. At least I've had people in my community who have said that, that they reframe their perspective on how cruelty could be morally beneficial yeah i think like I, I don't even know if i would use the word cruelty necessarily but i do tend to agree with you something i mean i've been criticized a million times for going hard on people and not being like super super nice to them and whatever um and i think there's value at times in not being nice to people like not everyone deserves niceness i do tend to believe that everyone deserves some level of kindness but i just i make a distinction between those things i think that there is like uh, there is a certain time and it's like, I can't get into the, all the details about it, but there is a time for the, the slap for the wake up for the time where it's like, Nope, you need to stop. Like, I mean, there was this one time that I, I went, I got a lot of, a lot, like some people got really mad at me about this. Other people really appreciated it, but I think it was really effective. And it, you know, I, I, it's hard to judge these things, but where I kind of like blew up on somebody and was like, no, like, like, I know you don't mean to do this, but what you're, what you're unintentionally signing off on is something really horrible. And like, I went pretty hard on that. And I think it served as a bit of a wake up call. And I think it can, there are some people who really need that. I have needed that in the past. There have been times in my past where there has been something that I was just like, you know, stuck on and having that little like shock of like, oh shit, somebody's being really serious with me right now. And they're willing to like, you know, put a little bit of that social pressure on can be helpful and good. So I do tend to agree with you on that. Um, and another thing that I would say to answer the original question, uh, is I, I wish that, um, I wish that, that the left as a whole would divorce itself from, um, liberal civility and and i say this not because civility isn't valuable in some circumstances but there is this um sort of weird assumption um and maybe it's this maybe it's from like the sorkin like and then somebody gave a passionate speech and everybody clapped and it was very proper and nice um or, or whatever like but that that approach has has continued to leave us in on the back foot we are going up against people who's uh who's you know to quote roger stone always be on the attack they don't believe in having a defense their idea is that you go aggro all the time and the american left has been on its back foot for a long time in this way and there's there's a certain desire to always play nice and play to these suppose these certain sensibilities but the reality is that Americans don't really even like that. Like a lot of Americans don't really even like that. I mean, the the 
Americans are 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 bombastic. We're annoying as fuck. And sometimes we like to see somebody who's willing to say something we might not even agree with, but in a way that is strong and and confident and uh and and um forward thinking, like on the aggressive. And I think the left needs to adopt that a little bit. Um we we need to to like stop aiming always for um for uh the the sort of i don't know what the right word is uh not really compromise necessarily but i think a lot of times there's this tendency to look at like extreme right wingers and say well, maybe we could win them over if we said this in a slightly nicer way or maybe they would be more likely to hear us out if we said this in a slightly different way if you're looking at a far rider if you're looking at somebody who was like me when i was younger when i was in a cult that is not it will not happen it will not get through it is I like the strongest right wing ideologies are are they will put a shell of of their ideology around you. They are literally designed to make you not be able to understand or even allow into your head the um the wisdom of the world to use the Christian term or there's all kinds of other ones liberal liberal logic or whatever you want to come up with. They are thought terminating critique uh, you know thought terminating cycles and those people can be reached when they've started to break their own shell but there are a million other people who are not indoctrinated there are a million other people who might have a few like right leaning tendencies or some edgy things or they might do some wrong things those are the majority of the people we're trying to reach and those people they want to know that they they don't they might have some like racist assumptions or they might have some sexist or some transphobic assumptions a lot of people got those transphobic ones um a lot of people got those racist ones but those people if they see somebody stand up and kick ass in the right direction that will be an inspiration to them because they have usually and most people will have contact with that type of shit from jingoistic hyper patriotic hyper nationalist bullshit and they're not used to seeing um strength from leftist positions but righteous rage is very very powerful it is very rhetorically and emotionally powerful and it speaks to a lot of people who are hurting really bad right now and if we cede that to just the right we're going to be they're, they're going to keep getting the most inspired and, ang and 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 emotionally worked up people obviously we don't have the same taglines we can't appeal to base disgust we can't uh, appeal to prejudice and this and we shouldn't frankly obviously um but they can do that but we still we, we still can show that righteous anger or righteous fury is is vi is viable um and then one other thing that i think this is a shorter one um like this is and this doesn't just apply to lefties but it applies to the general american left is like people need to realize what politics is Politics is jockeying for power. When you walk into a political space, it is going to be cutthroat. And your opponents are not going to be so kind as the infighting you have on the left, where most infighting on the left is just people block each other, call each other names, and then that's that. If you go up, if you're if you're going up against Dick Cheney, Dick Cheney is a guy who shot another man in the face, and that guy apologized to J Dick Cheney. Like publicly on national news this is the type of people that we're going up against and people who decide to make that step into politics on any side of the american left like need to understand that you need to understand that this is like that a lot of these this politics and this doesn't mean every single aspect of politics but if you're going into electoral politics if you're going into national politics it is a cutthroat business and people need to realize that i think because they will they will have a more sober approach to the tactics that are effective and the tactics that will actually get us victories and not have us die in a, a death camp. Because I really don't want us to die in a death camp. I really, really don't. Well said. What was the question again, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Just look, they're, they're fresh, man. I'm sorry. The question was, uh, are there parts of conservatism or conservative rhetoric that you find useful or you think that leftists should employ on a more consistent basis? Oh, guns. Mm. <laughs> that, 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 that's it. Guns. True. Listen, True. a Mossberg 590 with a Woodstock is fucking based. And I hope everybody has one in their fucking garage ready for that fucking intruder. K one Fellows thing that really a host, frustrates me a co -host, about the gun K Fellows is a co-host. Is the, 
there's the criminality aspect of guns and the constitutionality aspect of guns. We can have these conversations, and I would love to have conversations about the constitutionality of guns. I know, it but then very so clear. many Don't people, worry. in like whether it be in my community or communities at large, they'll say some shit. Well, the left wants to take your guns, and I'm like, listen to me, brother. I don't want to take your guns. In fact, I want to make sure that gun rights are fucking protected because they usually target black people. So I have a very invested interest I don't right in now, making but I sure that I stay fucking strapped. But that being said, I'm totally for disarmament. Unfortunately, there is one side of this art, this no. discourse we that do. does not want to give up their guns because no. there's only one no. like as long well, let, me, let me clarify it this way as long as the oppressor no. whatever the identified <laughs> enemy has guns then i'm gonna stay strapped however and, and we're in a, a state of like a stalemate which we're never gonna really get any farther so i'm we're, i'm not gonna see a lifetime where guns are gonna get taken away but yeah right right, right, right I, I, the get I, i'm this sorry idea Joe, that, no you got all right let's do it what do you got like like so being my people and you know my people's history right as long as long as you know we're only two percent of the population, fuck you. I'm keeping my guns, um, just to protect my my little bit of reservation land we have I left. I rifle first. Um, Useful. But on top of that, no things. fuck cold dead fingers. I'll go down that path. <laughs> um, that that that, that was it. that was one of the big things that that kept me on that libertarian side for so long, mm -hmm. until uh, uh, quite a few leftists kind of pointed out if I go farther left than um, rad libs, right. I can get my guns back, and uh, that was one of the happiest moments of my life. I thought I thought the Second Amendment was cool, and then Karl Marx had that whole line, and you know the whole like um, under no pretext, and I was like, wow, fuck the Second Amendment. This is way better. <laughs> I'm with that. Another can another I, thought can, I have. Oh. Go ahead, ahead. No, okay. no, I want to speak on the gun thing. I think most of us can agree that um, in an ideal sense, we would like to live in worlds where nobody felt they had to own a gun. Not so much because we trust the state to defend us, but because the idea of us even needing one is utterly unthinkable. Of course, that's not a world that we live in. And realistically, we're never going to get rid of interpersonal violence entirely. I've read a lot of really interesting data on gun ownership and its propensity to assist us in Difficult situations. Owning a gun does not make it more likely to defend yourself against an intruder if they break into your house. And the idea yep. that gun ownership can assist day. you in some sort of yes, John Rambo, you know, uh, shooters yeah, invade my local this. Walmart and I took them all out with my, you know, with, with my Glock. That doesn't happen either. There are people who use guns for hunting, of course, but let's leave that separately, of course. We're talking about guns used for self-defense or political purposes. The main reason that lefties like guns is because of the revolutionary argument, you know, that, um, you Not know, me. under no means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And conceptually, I couldn't disagree with this less. I mean, this is a phenomenal idea, really. We know the state has a monopoly on I can violence. Show you it after. We know that it would be lovely if stream. it didn't. And owning guns, you know, as a member of the proletariat, uh, does in some small part contribute to the shift in a power balance. And there's a lot of discourse on whether or not revolution can even happen these days. Um, I mean, you have a country like America. If America wants a part of the world turned into glass, then that gets what it wants. There's not really any civilian force that can meaningfully stand up against an army of drones and, you know, Except for maybe uh, 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 cannons Aaron. that can fire shells two miles into the shore. Like, this is it's not something we can really do. The real argument, then, would be that civilian ownership of firearms could be tangentially useful in matters of civilian occupation where total loss of life is not on the table. Or, alternatively, it can be helpful in some sort of inter-party conflict uh, where the military steps out that's usually what happens in coups if it's not a military coup if it's not the military itself doing the coup what usually well, happens Adam. is that the Thanks military is sympathetic to the side with the guns and steps back because that way they get to maintain this you know this this aesthetic of ambivalence and uh, in that case civilian firearm ownership actually is helpful sometimes arms are supplied one direction or another and i read all this and you know it's very fascinating um, maybe there is some revolutionary benefit to proletarian armaments. And uh, then it turns out that revolutions, or at the very least, mass protests, are way more likely to succeed if they're nonviolent. Because as it turns out, if you have this big protest and people know there's a decent shot of gunfire, 
happening at that protest, that there's going to be a clash with the police that'll lead to shots being fired into the crowd. People don't go out for that. People stay inside, which cuts down on membership and, you know, uh, advocacy efforts. I think that the question of whether or not guns are good in America today is infinitely less important than the question of what practically should we do with regards to guns? Because America has a bajillion fucking guns within its own borders. We're not getting rid of these guns. It's not happening. Yeah, it's true. This isn't Japan. This isn't the United Kingdom. Maybe the best thing that we can do is be gung-ho with guns to try to help conservatives on that wedge issue and fight for a world where we no longer feel as though we need them down the line. Because I feel like that gun thing, that's a really strong wedge issue that we can, uh, that, that, that we can push conservatives over on. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. One thing that I'm, I want to push back on a little bit, kind of gently, I understand that I think, I think there's a bit more to a point that you could probably elaborate on, is that one of the things that I, I'm very frustrated when I'm looking at the political movements um, in the past couple of years, whether it be Black Lives Matter or, or, or what have you, but I'll focus on it's Black Lives Matter here directly, panel. right? Holy is shit. that one of the, the problems that we're seeing panel. in real time is this collapse of communities, in this case, law enforcement, helping their communities. And something that really frustrates me is that you can kind of see the, the hypocrisy of like the power struggle in real time, where if, if, we're go if I'm going to a demonstration and I'm a law enforcement officer, my job is to make sure later, that people dangle, feel dangle, safe get your and rest. protected. And something that get happened rest, along the way support. is that the people got lost in that conversation were kind of relegated to something like property or what have you. And something that, um, that I keep hearing from conservatives especially is, is, is just that, where it's like, what's the job of law enforcement at demonstrations? And in reality, it should be to protect people. And something that happens when you don't protect people is that you create these power vacuums of people who might feel the need they have to arm themselves in opposition to a system that isn't going to protect them. But something that's very interesting over the summer and the No Fucking Around Coalition exposed that, and this is something with, with um, Grandmaster Jay that I kind of agree with, is that power recognizes power. So when you have an all black militia going into a demonstration and their job is just to protect people despite the fact that in in their instances all the instances where they had discharges were either accidental or from an outside party there there it was just they went there they did their thing and left but even then despite that you still saw instances of people trying to especially on the right painting them as this like un undisciplined un um unregulated militia which i would agree they are undisciplined however there's a side of it too which i which i'm trying to get righties on board with where it's like okay isn't it very incredible to see a, a, an all like just not even an all black militia let's just for race race the, the id pull like the modern id pull there just a group of people who understand that there's a power vacuum they're going there to protect people. They protect people and leave, but your argument's in training. So why don't we try to fight towards making sure that if people are going to mobilize this way, they are trained in a way that's appropriate. If um, I could jump off, off no, wait, on that. I, too. Oh, I just want to say that was framed as a disagreement with me, but I don't disagree with any yeah. of that. So Okay. Yeah, and if I could jump off. Yeah, that's that why just... I said it was like more, maybe probably just like a, a missed part there on my end. But yeah. Oh, um, no, I, I tend to take that that position as well, Joe, uh, like something along those lines, which is that, um, you know, I don't really look at gun ownership from like a, an individual perspective very frequently. I grew up in a state where everybody had guns. Every single household had guns. Uh, it was a very rural state. Um, I grew up around them. I'm comfortable with them. I think they're cool to shoot, whatever. Um, and I always advocate if people are actually, if they're personally thinking about it, you need to make sure that one, you have the safety stuff in 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 place, uh, you know, gun locks, et cetera, et cetera. And two, that you're mentally stable. Don't get a gun if you're not mentally, just don't do it. You're not like, don't, you're better off not having a gun, it's not, don't don't get into this revolutionary fantasizing thing. Um, and the way that I think I about agree. guns, yeah, the way that I tend to think about guns is that um, they are a, they are a preventative uh, step from certain groups that would otherwise feel much, much more at 
at ease uh, taking action on communities. And I like the, the line that you said, power recognizes power, because that is what it is. If, if you have, say, a gang of largely white supremacists that feels like it can go into a neighborhood and cause shit with little to no repercussion whatsoever, they might change their mind, and history seems to agree with this, even though there's no there's no way there will ever be a study on this. The 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 aggression with which um, the conservatives and Republicans in the in the country uh, tried to disarm black black folks and queer folks um, in the past seems to indicate that they are afraid of this. Um, it would show that these the, these communities being heavily and evenly communally armed would likely make them less likely to be considered a target in the first place. Think about it like this. Uh, if there's a somebody robbing a house and you have a dog, your dog never has to bite a person in order to stop your house from getting robbed. They're just going to choose a different house than one that has a dog in it. If you have a dog in your house, no one's going to rob your house. Why would they choose a house with a dog? That's ridiculous. So likewise, why would this potential, maybe existent, maybe non-existent white supremacist you know, uh, state sanctioned gang, like maybe they would just not choose your community to, uh, to try and oppress. And if all the communities are like that, maybe they'll just think twice before they going in there and never anything, nothing ever has to happen because the power recognizes the power. And that's all I wanted to, to jump off. Yeah. And, that's my and, perspective. and, and, and something to that also, which is why, again, like I've, I've had, it's almost over, I've had Lena. success with righties on this. Um, so I've been using it kind of in nauseam where we understand, like, there's this idea that the Black Panther Party was nothing more than guns and breakfast, right? And in reality, that's farther from the fucking truth. With that being said, one of the cleanest examples that we have of gun legislation that is was only designed to oppress people hey, Pete, was the Mulford like a great Act idea. in California. Um, a TLDR, basically the, the short and long of it, is that they changed the regulations of how you can carry guns publicly. And one of the things that they wanted to make sure was clarified is that if you have I open carry in though. California, you can't have any ammunition in there. It was clearly targeted at the Black Panther Party, despite the fact that they acknowledged the Minutemen militia, um, the Ku Klux Klan, and the Black Panthers in there. And despite for Don Mulford, that piece of shit, fucking cuckety cuck fuck boy, did zero research on the Minutemen militia or the Ku Klux Klan in his research and justifying that law, it still passed. And then, to make matters even more complicated, when the Black Panthers protested the assembly for that bill they walked in to the state legislature peacefully armed but peacefully they didn't even make it onto the assembly floor and they still dealt with them and what, what i mean by dealt with them is that after they protest despite the fact that they were legally allowed to go into the state building to protest this bill they they were arrested off site a couple hours later after their demonstration on bullshit. Bobby Seale, I want to say, served three months probation on that nonsense, despite the fact that they're just they were <laughs> exercising their rights, and that was it. But then the Mulford Act was fucking sneaky because that fucking California state legislature in the '60s was fucking notorious. They slipped in another clause that said you cannot have carry, uh, not have public carry inside of state buildings. Like that was just skirted into the Mulford Act. And something that I, I try to get people on board on is that look, like we we understand that we can't, as as Vosh laid out, like the idea that people are going to take all of our guns at mass. It's not going to fucking happen. It's not going to happen. But I think we can have better conversations around the constitutionality of guns and the criminality of guns. And this is a piece of gun legislation that had no basis in criminality reality. However, or constitutional reality, excuse me. However, there is something to be said about how the Cal how California and other areas, whether it be California, Chicago, Newark, um, Texas handled the Black Panther Party because they handled them with intense Thank aggression you so much, that Glass. initiated aggression. Thank you so much. If that makes sense. So you don't stage in front of a Black Panther Party headquarters, strapped to the nines. That's asking for problems. And then the, the, they did things like make threats to two different local to, to chapters, threats to members or known affiliated businesses of that. And 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 it really frustrates me how. When the NRA supported gun control, it was for black Americans. And then even in my arguments, I can't even use like that, like that acknowledgement. So I kind of have to flip it, right? I have to explain to them, hey, this is a clear example of a misunderstanding, like 
a misunderstanding of how the Black Panther Party navigated, and an, even more so, a misunder a lack of research for Don on Don Mulford's part and everybody who introduced that legislation from fucking dumb fuck uh, God, what's his name, um, like John John Knox, who's a piece of fucking shit, like all of those fucking people introduced that bill and the people who brought that into legislation. Like I want to have better conversations about gun gun control and like how we can get to a society where we might not need these things. Dep yeah. and, and again, like that that conversation of where you feel about okay, maybe we like I don't want to take my people take my guns no matter what. Like that's cool. Cool, but uh, we're yeah, bogged down in I this like do level one argument of, like the left wants to take our I'll guns. I'll show you next time you're like, here, sugar glass. No, we fucking don't. <laughs> well, whoa, 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 whoa. Tom has really something important to say. Uh, yeah, we gotta end it here. We're gonna let Hello. everybody go around and uh, give their outros. We'll start with sock done left and go up from there. Um, and then if you guys want to give like any last words on this, uh. You can go ahead and do that as well. So, uh, is it Aiden? You said, uh, yeah, Aiden. Yeah, appreciate you joining, man. Go ahead and uh, give us your outro. Uh, sure. I mean, so hey, um, I'm Aiden. I run the channel Socialism Done Left. I haven't spoken for much because I got a little tired at the end. That's what I was saying in DMs. Uh, on the gun topic, I dissent from the other people here, but I didn't want to bring up a debate while we were near the end of the show. Um, so maybe we could have a conversation about that another time. Um, on most of the rest of the issues, I think the panel is generally in agreement. It sounded like we thought that the left would use, would be better to use rhetoric, which is more easily accessible to people. It'd be more um, beneficial to be accepting of people who are previously right wing. It'd be more beneficial to use, um, to generally use tactics which are trying to bring, bring people in rather than just create sort of like purist communities. Um, so I think that there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, in short, I think that like a lot of the research on how you actually persuade people does align with the idea that you shouldn't impugn people for their, their identity. You shouldn't make feel someone unvalued or unloved in general. Um, you know whether it is true or not, you should try to make someone feel valued and loved and bring them into the leftist community. Um, so I like that. I like that there was broad agreement on that point. Awesome, man. I really appreciate you joining. Um, and if you need to, you can go ahead and jump out. I appreciate you staying up with us, uh, Vash. Sorry, I had the mute button on, didn't realize. Yeah, um, I think that socialism is cool. I think that not socialism isn't cool. Um, it really sums up, I think, the complexities of my position. Now, in all, in all seriousness, like, if the online left continues behaving the way that it does, we're, we're giving up a massive opportunity here. I mean, we're getting clowned on, seriously in terms of uh, ability to organize, convert people, willingness to accept new converts into our movement, interest in getting such, we're getting clowned on. And we're getting clowned on, and this is the humiliating part, by conservatives. These people are not very impressive, and yet we are getting clowned on. We need to stop with that. Our True. ideas are better. Our prescriptions are better. The world we want to build is better. And keep in mind, most everyone is trying to make what they think is the world better. Fascists too, you know, they just have a whole bunch of wacky ideas as to how to best do that. Uh, our ideas are not wacky. They're actually quite straightforward. So we should be no, able to not, appeal to them on these bases. And sometimes we do, often we do, but we could be doing it way, way, way more. So we need to work on that. This is not a social space. Leftism is not a community branch. It's not a club. It's a political movement. And we're going to have to share it with people who we hate, whether we like it or not. Awesome, man. Appreciate you joining. Also, uh, viewers, the stream is not ending. Just to let you know, we're just going through outros. Uh, some of us will still be here afterwards and continue. Stream is over. Yeah, <laughs> Hans of Hark here, man. Appreciate your joining. Appreciate your help with some of the topics too. Go ahead and shout yourself out. Yeah, really appreciate it. Again, everyone. Um, sorry, I didn't get jumping about the dump, uh, the gun stuff. I uh, wrote my senior thesis in college on guns. So just like quickly for everyone who isn't, uh, you know, who wants like this pragmatic, like you know, uh, like solutions to like gun stuff. Uh, the best things that m me and my team came up with over six months was specifically uh, have a national registry. Uh, most contentious thing out of the way first. Uh, non-mandatory buybacks, and then just state uh, uh, free state training for all people who have firearms to cut, cut down on accidental deaths. And everything aside from that, just like fixing oh, community uh, wealth issues. Um, hopefully that was uh, quick enough for, for that. Uh, if you like uh, what I had to say, uh, all that sort of stuff, uh, I'm Hans, Hans of Park here. You can find me on YouTube and Twitch. 
Uh, I go over news. I uh, play Pokemon uh, when I'm tired and drunk. And I like doing debates. Um, I was relatively uh, uncombated tonight because this was a panel where I was talking with uh, people I mostly agree with. And I like every, pretty much everyone on this panel. Uh, and I hope to have more conversations with everyone in the future. Uh, if you uh, want to debate me, I will put you in the ground uh, metaphorically in Minecraft. And I'm just really happy <laughs> to have uh, everyone here. I think this was... Uh, I'm sorry if I put some people to sleep, but again, I'm really appreciating uh, everyone who came on and uh, all the topics. We did we did a good discourse tonight. Yeah, we did we did the discourse for sure. It was really good. And uh, guys, definitely go check out Hans's YouTube channel. He's got great book reviews on there. Uh, Joe Lewis, appreciate you joining, man. Last minute jumping in. It was awesome to have you. Ooh, I'm muted. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. This is, this is really fun. I guess in closing, like the things that I have, like the number one thing that I, I want is um, community great. control of economic frameworks that produce goods and services, that produce and retail goods and services. Um, the only way that I've found that I can get people on that board is through active community involvement. And everybody's part of a community and, and, and you got to just get involved in whatever way possible. It's going to feel lonely as fuck from time to times but i think it's it's the path worth taking um because and then you'll you'll love the results um hopefully <laughs> um with that being said um i do stream on twitch twitch.tv slash joe lewis um the o is a zero um i talk about other stuff unrelated to this topic but we do a lot of stuff over there but it's a lot of fun glad to glad to have a conversation with people that i i like barely cross paths on hopefully we can have probably more a better sit down and a better setting for that but i'm glad to be here and thank you for having me tom this was great I'm glad it came out uh demon mama yeah uh as you all know i am demon mama um i really really was thankful to be on this panel thank you so much for having me i thought this was really amazing and my audience seems to have loved it as well um yeah, I mean, I don't have much else to add. I feel like I, I made my uh, opinions very clear. If you liked my opinions, you can always come in, uh, and, and hang out on my website um, or follow me on YouTube, which is where I usually stream. If you didn't, you can come by and debate me. I always do Q&A and open for some level of debate after every panel. So swing by if you're into that sort of thing. And other than that, uh, thank you so much for having me on. Um, yeah, I was really happy to be here. Yeah, you made a lot of really great points. A lot of a lot of stuff that really uh, resonated with me. So I really appreciate you coming on, yeah, no Samantha Banana. Thank you so much for being good today. I, I really appreciated that. I, I was intimidated. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I'm Samantha Banana. Um, I'm a relatively like new, relatively new like leftist. Um, still learning. I stream sometimes. Most of the time I'm streaming Dungeons and Dragons with my other um, Twitch politics friends who are a bunch of freaking nerds. Um, we got more content Other times you'll see soon, me everyone. hopping around panel to panel to panel being a problematic little fucking shit. Um, but no place I'd rather be than hanging out, learning, and uh, finding new ideas and ways to better ourselves and hopefully better society as a whole. Um, that's about that. True. Appreciate it coming on. Uh, Kate... I would give you an outro, but you've talked way too much today. Um, I, I don't think I can give you any more airtime, honestly. It's I know, guys. I'm so sorry. I have to apologize. I am I am the full time mother to two tiny gremlins that literally run my entire life, and the smallest one has been having some trouble sleeping at night. So Aww. I have been in and out dealing with that. But I have loved the discussion. I have learned a lot. Um, so I, I just appreciate being able to be here and listen to all of you guys, your ideas and your opinions on things. Um, I would like, I, I'm, I'm following mostly all of you on different platforms. Um, looking forward to continuing to learn more. Um, and I really appreciate all of you guys taking the time to come on and talk with us. Yeah. Uh, this was a great panel. Uh, you guys great. all did an awesome job. Sometimes we have like bunch of people come on for panels and they all just don't have much to say and there's like dead air for long periods of time and i'm like oh my goodness dude like what what am i supposed to say now like <laughs> i've run out of things to talk Not about I, I talk all the time on my own stream they're all here to hear you guys but uh unfortunately i had a lot of technical difficulties today like i i, I lost most of the audience on my side but hopefully it was all uh is still on for you guys and uh your uh your audiences were able to keep up um 
yeah, we try to do the panels just a little bit differently. Maybe there are other people who were doing this, but I'm new to Twitch and it just seemed like there was a void that needed to be filled where everything was blood sports and they'd say like, oh, well, we want it to be educational, but first we needed to be entertained. Pop, pop, I pop. wanted to be educational first. Hopefully the education uh, people who enjoy learning, it'll be, uh, the, that'll be the entertaining part of it is uh, getting to like listen Twitch to panels. a bunch this of people was a good one. Uh, that they're able to learn from. So I really appreciate you guys coming on. Um, we're here every Wednesday night Isn't uh, that great, at 9.15 Eastern time on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Um, and then also I stream just about every single day uh, just doing random stuff like uh, research. One, I think right now we're researching immigration uh, and we'll continue doing that for the rest of this week. And, uh, and then sometimes I play video games as well. So uh, you can check me out on Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube at Tom Fuller EPC. Outside of that, appreciate all you guys coming on. You guys have a good night. Thanks, Tom. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Have a Take good care. night. Have a, great, have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. See you. <clears throat> yeah, and anybody who wants to stick around definitely can. I meant to say that. Uh. <laughs> All righty. Damn. That was fucking awesome. That was Pog. That was Pog as fuck. Damn, damn, damn. And guess what? We've got more stuff coming. Don't get, don't go.